Sergeants, uh, all sergeants, uh, you could begin your recording. EC recording started. Our recording is good. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Sergeant Sadowski, you may begin. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, and we are ready to begin. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Jimmy Van Bramer, and I am the chair of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. And I want to thank everyone for joining us here today for this very important uh, hearing and topic. First, I want to recognize the council members who are in this hearing with us today, Council Member Francisco Moya, uh, Council Member Adams, uh, Council Member Lewis and Council Member uh, Joe Borelli, uh, both uh, Council Members Moya and Borelli are members uh, of our committee and we thank the other Council Members uh, for joining us as well. There will be others joining along the way and I will certainly recognize other Council Members as they join the hearing. Today we are addressing a very important topic, Black Lives Matter, anti-racism, structural racism and the arts. Uh, I don't need to tell anyone, but, and I see council member Mark Joni has just joined uh, the hearing as well. But racial inequity and discrimination against uh, black indigenous and people of color in this country dates, dates back to the very beginning uh, of colonization and slavery. But the global response and protests related uh, to the deaths of uh, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Brenna Taylor, and too many others uh, have with very good reason uh, sparked, uh, reignited national conversations about race, uh, police funding, and community engagement. I was proud to vote no on the most recent budget that in my opinion did not uh, defund the NYPD. Um, but it is significant that more and more people uh, across the world are waking up uh, to the fact that racism is structural and it is not just enough to talk about it, we must actually do something about it. And it is very important to note that this most recent budget uh, significantly cut arts in education and that uh, defunding of arts and education disproportionately affects BIPOC uh, communities, in particular uh, the children of color uh, who are disproportionately lacking in those resources. Some have said that this period feels like 1918, 1932, and 1968 rolled into one. A global pandemic, uh, a Great Depression, and an uprising, a civil rights uprising, all unfolding together. Uh, and that makes clear more than ever, the inequities, but also the urgency. That's why we're here today, uh, to listen, to learn, and to act. An estimated 15 to 26 million people participated in Black Lives Matter marches and demonstrations and rallies in 2020, uh, 2020 uh, across the country making it one of the largest uh, movements in the nation's history. Uh, new conversations have been rich, sometimes painful, and I hope increasingly fruitful, uh, happening, happening on an organic level in the cultural community as well. Uh, it is especially important that we center and lift up voices of color. Uh, this process must include looking inward and ensuring that BIPOC artists' work is centered in the conversations, that curators at our city's museums are increasingly uh, representative and 
persons of color, especially at the leadership level uh, across the board. Arts and culture uh, is among the most impactful ways to affect societal change. Uh, explore racial and ethnic representations, reflect a community's history and identity, and provide an opportunity to engage diverse audiences in transformational learning. Uh, and institutions, some institutions have responded to the Black Lives Matter movement. While it is a step in the right direction that many organizations and institutions have made statements acknowledging that they too are guilty of structural racism at their institutions, um, we need to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. Structural racism exists in everything and everywhere, uh, from the lack of diversity in museum staff uh, to potential lack of art education op options in BIPOC communities. <clears throat> According to uh, post-budget analysis by ArtNet, while the 2021 budget includes an 11% reduction to the Department of Cultural Affairs, which is less than uh, many other agencies, but it's still too much in my opinion, there's a $15 million cut from the $21.5 million budget for arts education services in middle and high schools, which equates to a roughly 70% reduction. Uh, that's reason enough to vote against that budget alone. But we need to think about what cuts like that do to uh, the middle schoolers and high schoolers, uh, particularly uh, the BIPOC young people. Government must address systemic racism with improved systems, practices, and new laws developed for racial equity across all fields and sectors, including education, uh, but obviously also uh, criminal justice, uh, jobs, housing, public infrastructure and health, uh, and needless to say, culture and the arts. Uh, we are here today because Black Lives Matter. And while we are ultimately nowhere near uh, our end goals, we are still working to create and design equity into all aspect, aspects of our public life. Uh, the council in having this hearing today seeks to uh, listen and understand the impact of this movement uh, on the cultural community and the cultural community's impact on this movement. Uh, what organizations are doing, uh, which voices are being lifted and what the council can do to support that path forward. We have a number of witnesses who are going to testify from the public today. And first, of course, as uh, we usually do, we'll hear from Commissioner Casals representing the Department of Cultural Affairs and the administration. Um, and I know there are a lot of questions about what more the administration can be doing and what more uh, change they can be driving. And, and I think that's an important conversation that I hope Commissioner Casals will address in his testimony. I also know that uh, uh, the acclaimed uh, uh, artist Vinnie Bagwell is uh, joining us here today and will be speaking. And I know there are uh, and obviously we will hear from Vinny, but I hope that the commissioner will address the status of the replacement of the Sims statue and, and talk to uh, some of the issues uh, around uh, that. Uh, I wanna recognize that Majority Leader Lori Cumbo has joined us uh, as well. And I wanna thank my uh, legislative director, Jack Bernadovitz, uh, Chief of Staff Matt Wallace, our committee's principal financial analyst, Alia Ali, uh, our policy analyst, Christy Dwyer, and our committee counsel, Brenda McKinney. And I wanna thank everyone here for joining us uh, today and look forward to a powerful hearing and discussion. So 
I will hand it over to our legislative council to deliver the oath to Commissioner Gonzalo Casals. Uh, we'll hear his testimony, have questions from the council members, and then we will move on to public testimony. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. Um, I am Brendan McKinney, Council of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations of the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling on panelists to testify. So before we move to the administration of the oath, I'm just going to go over some procedures for today's hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you, called on, you are called on, you'll be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce who the next panelist will be. Council member questions will be limited to five minutes and council members, please note that this includes both questions and the witness answers. Please also note that we will not have a second round of questions at today's hearing. For public testimony, I will call up individuals and panels. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom, please. You'll be called on after everyone in the panel, usually of four individuals, has completed their testimony. For public panelists, once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will go ahead and uh, go ahead to begin speaking after setting the timer. All public testimony will be limited to a three minute clock. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting. We'll remind you of this periodically throughout the hearing. So now we will move to administration testimony. So Commissioner Casals, um, I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Gonzalo Casals, the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and Sheila Feinberg, the Deputy Commissioner of the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. I will deliver the oath to both of you and after I'll call upon each of you individually to respond to the oath. Uh, you will also be unmuted now to respond. Uh, please raise your right hand if you could in the frame. Thank you so much. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and respond to council member questions honestly at today's hearing? Uh, Commissioner Casals? I do. Thank you. And Deputy Commissioner Feinberg? I do. Thank you. Commissioner Casals, you may begin your testimony when ready. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Chair Van Bremer and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the urgent topic, Black Lives Matter, anti-racism, structural racism, and the arts. I'm joined today for Q&A by DCLA Deputy Commissioner Sheila Feinberg. There's a little question that we're facing an overdue reckoning with systemic racism that has shaped our society as a whole, including the cultural sector. While the pandemic and the violence against Black Americans have brought renewed attention to these issues, efforts to understand and address them by POC-led organizations stretch back generations. In the 1970s and 80s, through self-determination and community organizing, new wave of cultural organizations were established to address the exclusion of communities of colors from Eurocentric mainstream institutions. These organizations, such as Studio Museum in Harlem, El Museo del Barrio, National Black Theater, and the Museum of Chinese in the America, have contributed to the transformation of New York's cultural ecology into something altogether more inclusive, vibrant, and reflective of the people who live here. They establish a new model for arts groups as a culture as culturally specific organizations. We're organizing an advocacy were just as central to their mission as the presentation of artwork. We continue to be inspired by their examples to date, which can help us guide the work we still have ahead of us. I owe my career to a generation of Latinx leaders that fought for representation and created training grounds for those that follow their steps. Today, I want to personally acknowledge the work of Dr. Marta Moreno Vega, Rafael Montañez Ortiz, and Susana Leval, among so many other Latinx leaders that helped establish the notion of Puerto Rican, Latinx, and Caribbean culture in New York City. The Department of Cultural Affairs has built on the achievements of these community advocates and activists who have pushed diversity, equity, and inclusion and anti-racism to the center of the agenda. 
In 2015, my predecessor, Tom Finkelpel, announced a new initiative to examine the diversity of the city's cultural force. While the topic had been brought up by previous administrations, it was the first time the agency commissioned a comprehensive study of demographics of the sector. After our report found major disparities, the cultural workforce was found to be majority white in a city where a majority of residents are people of color, we set out to address this glaring issue. The public-private partnership is the foundation of the city's relationship with arts and culture. With private nonprofits, we steward public assets and investments for the benefit of all New Yorkers. So our efforts to foster a cultural sector that reflects the public is serving have placed great emphasis in the public-private partnerships we develop. To build a better pipeline, we focus on cultivating diversity at all levels of employment. The Create NYC Leadership Accelerator is a professional development program that helps more diverse candidates up through the ranks of the sector into leadership positions. This is based on the 2016 study that found that lower mid-level cultural workers were far more diverse than leadership. The CUNY Cultural Course, which has, date, has to date placed hundreds of students into paid internships at cultural organizations, reduces the barriers to entry-level employment. <clears throat> we changed the application for our cultural development fund su support to include questions about diversity, equity, and inclusion. This means that every single cultural group getting this DCL funding, we're talking about around, there, around a thousand um, every year, has to spell out the ways they engage diverse workers and audiences. To make sure that the leadership and boards of organizations were brought into these efforts of self-examination and progress, we require diversity, equity, and inclusion plans for 34 members of our cultural institutions group. Adopted in spring 2019, these DEI plans are among the first of their, their kind in the country. The members of the CAG embrace the opportunity to examine and address the barriers within their organizations. In just over a year, the plans have produced far-reaching changes, which in many cases have been accelerated by the reckoning over racial justice. Anti-racist training is now required for many staffs and boards. New committees have been established to hold organizations accountable from within, and many groups reported that the first year of implementing their plans helped to build a shared language and community. This provides a foundation for more additional steps like adjusting human resources policies, revamping teaching and interpretation in strategies in order to tell more complete stories about our institution's collections. <clears throat> To be able to authentically engage in this work, the CLA needs to do it too. We have an internal DEI committee and are taking a hard look at our policies and how they affect now on, not only our staff, but the cultural groups that we work with and support. We have a chief diversity offer, officer to guide us and hold us accountable internally. And the team that administers program funding has been engaged in a deep years long examination of our funding practices to identify ways we, we, in which we can eliminate barriers to receive support. We have also made major strides toward increasing the share of agency investment in cultural groups that are doing the work in underserved communities. More than $25 million in additional funding has been allocated to groups based on the work of their social impact of the arts project, as well across the board increases to favor smaller organizations. We redirected additional funding to these groups through the Met Museum Admissions Agreement. And while the financial impacts of COVID-19 continue to reverberate, we're proud, to, we're proud of these investments and will continue to support organizations that are working in underserved, underserved neighborhoods. In just last few years, we have seen a major shift in mainstream organizations. A protest spread following the killings of George Floyd, Birana Table, and other Black Americans, the leaders of major cultural institutions here and across the world, loudly and explicitly condemned systemic racism. It was an inspired moment, but at the same time, the pandemic has shown us more than ever how much work we need to do to repair centuries worth of oppression. Words must be followed by actions. Beyond these necessarily longer term policy solutions, we're also inspired to see artists and art groups participate in the fight for racial justice here and now. Art at its best can help us make sense of the changes happening around us. One example of these are the Black Lives Matter murals that people painted on streets around the city. In Brooklyn, 
Indira Tawaro of the Billie Holiday Theater spearheaded the Black Lives, Ma Black Lives Matter mural on Fulton Street that represented the names of murdered Black Americans in its powerful design. In Manhattan, just a block from City Hall on Center Street, three artists designed another mural that helped to channel the public mood on support to the BLM movement and connected to deeper artistic traditions. One of these artists, Sofia Dolson, is now serving as the public artist in residency with the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, where her creative practice will help foster individual healing, community restoration, and systemic transformation. The PER program, by PER mean um, public artists in residency, points to another way that artists and creative expressions can be engaged in solving the ur urgent problems facing us today. As I have said, these symbolic and creative responses are important, but the symbolic actions must be accompanied by, by real actions to improve people's life and address the legacy of racial injustice that pervades our communities. There is still so much more work to be done. I look forward to working with council and the cultural community to continue moving the conversation forward in meaningful ways. It is important to seize the opportunities of a structural change that this crisis has presented us. We need to move forward in authentic, proactive ways. For each of us individually, this is the work of a lifetime. For our cultural organizations, it's the work of generations. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Commissioner Casals. And I know, I know you uh, care deeply about this work, uh, and I, I know that uh, on a personal level, this is part of your life's mission as well. Uh, but now, of course, you represent the Department of Cultural Affairs and the mayor's administration. And, and so it is important to ask you know, the tough questions. And you said a number of things, and I'll ask a couple of bigger picture things and then get more specific, but uh, are we doing enough? Is the de Blasio administration doing enough? And is the Department of Cultural Affairs doing enough to end structural racism, systemic racism within the cultural community? Um, yes, um, it is my perspective that we're doing enough, um, at, at least you know, in terms of the uh, long-term work that needs to happen. And, and creating sustainable change. Um, I, like I said, you know, in moments like these, um, what we also need is symbolic actions, um, like the murals and like you know, um, removal of um, um, removal of um, monuments, and you name it. But uh, it is important to remember that uh, back in 2015, when this administration and this agency install the conversation of diversity and said we're going to measure and get real data. Um, everybody was really worried because there was a lot of uh, concern about what was going to happen. And that was a very um, important way, a meaningful way in which you know this work started. And we continue to do that. We continue to do surveys every other year and we continue to um, work with culture organizations in improving and expanding their goals in terms of the DEI. So oh, let me let me just say uh, I believe that that there are some significant efforts underway, and I certainly again have deep respect for you. Uh, but I'm surprised to hear you answer the question that yes, we are doing enough, uh, both the administration and the Department of Cultural Affairs. In some ways, I find that shocking because you know. The things that you talked about, we're going to talk about some of them. You know, we're, we might be moving in the right direction in some places. We might be tinkering around the edges in some ways. But, but to say that this administration and the Department of Cultural Affairs and the city of New York are doing what it can. Uh, at this particular moment in time is simply not true. I, I, again, I say that with deep respect for you personally, but how can any of us say with a straight face that we're doing all we need to do in this moment uh, while racism 
runs rampant and and we see the diversity numbers i'm going to ask you about those but we we see uh what that looks like and yes i think there's some well-intentioned people who are who are taking stock and and engaging in in anti-racism work but but do you honestly believe i'll sort of ask it again do you honestly believe that this administration the department of cultural affairs the city are doing uh, all that it needs to do to end uh, uh, the structural racism that exists within uh, the cultural community. Um, yes, I do believe that you know my agency, within you know their purview and within you know the resources that we have, um, we're doing um, everything that we can do. Again, it's a matter of time um, in order for this work to um, be um, successful. Um, the change has to be, you know, structural, and it has to be with enough time. I have seen it myself. Um, um, a lot of um, organizations hire by POC and folks without necessarily um, putting enough emphasis on changing organizational culture, changing, you know, um, opportunities for, you know, collective leadership, and how um, both the organizations have failed on that and how difficult has been you know, for the employees. And that's one of the many examples why I continue to say that um, um, you know, that it's gonna take a while to see significant change, but um, we, we have seen enough of that and we, we wanna to continue to work on, on this line. Um, so let me uh, uh, talk about, um, um, Vinny, I see your hand up, but I think we're going to uh, have you speak in a, a, a few moments. Um, uh, let me just uh, say, again, you talked about resources, right? And with the resources that we have, but that was part of the question, of course, right? Is that the mayor uh, and the council are, are, are involved in a discussion about the, the very, uh, nature of your resources, uh, how much and where, and to whom uh, they go to. You know, the budget was was cut for the Department of Cultural Affairs. The uh, Department of Education's budget for arts and education for middle and high schools was cut seventy percent. That's a failure, right? That is a it is an absolute failure on the part of this administration to recognize the importance of these budgets, the importance of these programs, and the disproportionate uh, impact that those cuts have on, on BIPOC communities, correct? Yes, uh, but I must say also that a, a 10%, 11% cut from a historical high um, funding from last year um, consider the um, the situation in which the, the city, the state, and the country are are in. Um, it's 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 a good thing. Um, we we can always you know take more money. You know that we can always continue to invest more money in in arts and culture. Um, you and I know that um, better than anyone. But um, um, again, you know, in the distribution of resources, um, I think the administration continues to. Um, to support arts and culture at an important, as a priority, um, an important level. Um, I know it's a priority for you. I know it's a priority for me. I know it's a priority for everyone on this call. Um, you know, having uh, worked with this administration for seven years now, um, I think culture and the arts has been much more of a priority for the city council. Uh, than for the administration. And, and you're right, that 11% cut that the department received this year is smaller than many other agencies. And, you know, I'm proud uh, of my work behind the scenes fighting for that. And, and Majority Leader Cumbo uh, certainly is a fierce fighter as well um, with me on this. And, and we did some good things like making sure there were no cuts to the Coalition of Theaters of Color. Uh, but but there is still so much more to be done, which is again why, you know, I, I, I am surprised to hear anyone say that we're doing what we can, all that we should, 
in this moment. Um, and that includes uh, you, Commissioner Casals. I know you're representing the administration uh, and the mayor in this hearing, but uh, this is not a moment where anyone should be uh, saying we're doing all that we can. I would imagine it would be a much more introspective answer and saying that while we are doing some good things, we are all a call to do far more right now uh, to, to end structural racism, you know, uh, meaningfully impact the numbers, which I'll get to and, and uh, address the, the racism and inequities in our system. And I believe you feel that personally. I, I, I believe you know what is, um, what is it's, it's a matter of language, right? We do know that we can at the agency, yes. Is there a lot more work that needs to be done? For sure. You know, like I said, you know, each of us need to work internally um, in, in just learning and continue to remove our unconscious bias. And our culture organizations need to continue to do a lot of more work. Um, so let's talk a little bit about numbers. So as you know, I was involved with the cultural plan and, and, and create NYC. And from that flowed a number of uh, studies and uh, questionnaires. And there was a, a big uh, New York Times article, and I'm sure you read, uh, because we were both quoted in it um, uh, a couple of months ago, talking about the fact that it, it hasn't, all of these efforts have not yet produced the change that we seek. Uh, and and so, you know, tell me today how successful you think this has been and how, how we can quantify that success, right? Can you point uh, uh, to uh, uh, some, some numbers and, and some, some facts that demonstrate that we're actually creating real structural change within these organizations and institutions? Um, not just simply polling them, uh, essentially, as to what their, uh, whether they have a DEI committee and what that committee is doing and, and, and what, what uh, targeted changes they're making. How, how, how do we make more people believe with, with real, with reality that, that things are changing, right? That, that it's actually forcing not just the conversation within the board of a major uh, and wealthy cultural institution, but actually transforming that institution. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, important to understand that um, um, while diversifying the workforce, um, it's extremely important. Um, that's a means to something else, right? And probably that's one of the few things that can be quantified um, what we're trying, to, what we're talking about here, what my, my hope is that everybody understands in, in cultural organizations is that we're talking about a mind shift, right? And, and of course that mind shift comes by bringing enough different perspectives, at, you know, the decision-making process in each cultural organization to understand, you know, how we need to be better at representing and telling stories and, and even the way we treat our employees. Um, and um, that mind shift is difficult to um, quantify, right? But we, uh, like I said in my testimony, um, in, it, it was probably um, hard to imagine six years ago that you know many cultural organizations would be putting these plans together, that um, boards will be talking about um, white supremacy um, and you know um, racial injustices and. Having installed the conversation is the big first step. Um, having organizations put plans that they talk about structural long-term change is a big step. And we are just now um, seeing um, after a year, we're gonna start seeing the results of those plans. So we're gonna to continue to fine tune the direction in which helping the organizations fine tune the direction in which these um, plans should go and the goals that they need to um, emphasize. Will you be publishing the results? You know, yes, anything that is sent to um, us um, is um, 
it's public knowledge. So um, um, we'll, we'll certainly will be sharing that information. Right. And, and I know when you say that for these boards to be having conversations about white supremacy is something that was unimaginable six years ago, there are probably millions of people in this country who would say that's, uh, that's shocking, right? That only today they're having conversations about white supremacy uh, and structural racism within their institutions, right? Um, so um, uh, while again, that may feel like a step in the right direction for a lot of people, for, for many it is, it is long overdue and, and even unacceptable that just in 2020, an institution might actually be talking about white supremacy. Um, but I mean, you that, mentioned- that, that, that speaks a little bit about, you know, the importance of, uh, of, of the power of, an, of, of the agency in, in being able to establish conversations and, and sort of encourage cultural organizations to go in a, in a, in a direction that um, aligns with, you know, the values of the administration. So uh, can I can I ask you if, if you have had conversations with Mayor de Blasio about uh, uh, structural racism in the cultural community and where, for example, uh, the the Vinnie Bagwell uh, work is at, and um, what is the the nature of the discussion within the administration? Uh, many of us here know that you directly report to Deputy Mayor Vicki Bean, um, but uh, you know, at what level are these conversations going on that include Mayor de Blasio and the Deputy Mayors and, and, and where are those conversations with, with you? I did uh, have a conversation with uh, Mayor de Blasio about these issues. Um, we're not specific issues about, um, you know, specific ex um, organizations or, or um, projects, but a, a high level, you know, of, of what um, the importance of um, equity and inclusion in arts and culture. And um, this is a conversation that we have um, very often with um, Deputy Mayor uh, Bean. Um, so that's good to hear that you had um, uh, the mayor's ear on on this issue is that uh, fair to say? Um, I I had conversations with him. I, I'm I'm not sure you know what you mean by having the mayor's ear, but um. Well, I mean, do you feel that you have access to the mayor and that the mayor, you, you know, you mentioned that that. The, that this is a priority for the administration. Obviously, the mayor is the head of the administration. So, you know, I, I think it's important for the Department of Cultural Affairs commissioner to have access to the mayor and to have the ear of the mayor and to be able to influence the mayor on uh, these topics. So, um, I don't know if you care to address any of those particulars. Yeah, I agree with you. That's important, and you know there are multiple ways in which um, the agency um, uh, shows up and you know um, sort of influences um, a policy at the city level. Um, one of the many is um, I sit on the um, um, race and equity um, commission um, task force um, that was put together at the um, um, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and specifically on the um, um, on the subcommittee on youth education. That's right. one of the main examples. So uh, I mentioned it a couple of times. You have, you've you've not chosen to address it. Obviously, uh, Vinnie Bagwell is going to be uh, speaking soon, um, and and obviously uh, share thoughts. But uh, can you address from the Department of Cultural Affairs perspective where we're at? On yeah, of course. And we have been in contact with some of the uh, stakeholders involved about that. Um, so um, with the, when the uh, pandemic hit, you know, and the city and the state had to shut down, um, all capital projects had been put on pause. Um, little by little, the city is restarting um, those capital 
um, projects. Um, the, there are a couple of priorities um, that um, sort of define the criteria of what's allowed to go move forward. One of them are COVID related um, capital projects and, and capital projects also in hardest hit areas um, in the city. The other one is a priority of projects that had already um, started construction. And um, OMB continues to monitor um, cash flow in the city and continues to allow those projects to start. In the case of um, Victory Villan Sims, um, which is the, um, the project that you asked me about, um, and by the time the pandemic hit, there were starting negotiations between the um, EDC, who's going to be the agency that's going to be managing this, um, this project, and the uh, contractor. Those conversations were stopped, um, were put on pause, and we're hoping that very soon those conversations will resume. As soon as that's, that contract is signed, then we can move on into um, um, signing a contract um, between EDC and the um, artists. Uh, so I, I want to move on soon to uh, Majority Leader Combo, but I want to ask just in relation to that, and obviously, you know, that's very frustrating. We all in the council obviously have experienced pauses on many capital projects, whether they be schools or parks and whatnot, but, and some, some have been restarted, right? Yeah. OMB is letting some things go. Are there any, uh, capital uh, projects and any is anything moving at the department of cultural affairs has anything been moved to priority status or is everything on pause no some projects uh, have started you know an example of a project that i visited recently is music hall at snack harbor in staten island um and this, oh, I cannot tell you over the top of my mind, um, but there are a few projects that started and we continue to um, work with um, OMB, DDC and EDC to continue to prioritize um, and, and push you know, for other projects to restart. And are you pushing for this one to be restarted? Yep. Yes. Um, uh, you know, I, I know that this is uh, uh, slightly above your your pay grade commissioner, but as you know, the, the governor just unveiled a, a statue of, uh, you know, Mother Cabrini that he fast tracked and, and got done within a year, including during the uh, COVID crisis. And, uh, and yet the city, you know, is not able to uh, make uh, this particular uh, uh, piece of uh, art move and, and, uh, there is a lot of uh, significance to this, and it is very frustrating for people to see. Uh, while I, you know, have respect for the work that Mother Cabrini did, uh, frustrating to see that one move with such uh, rapidity, and then to have uh, other pieces of of equal importance not move uh, at all, and um, and so I just want to say that I, I think. Uh, uh, Vinny Bagwell and others may have more to say about that too, but you know, I, I think you know we just want to see a sense of urgency around uh, this kind of work, and and I think you you know that. I just my last question before I go to uh, majority of the combo. You mentioned the the department eliminating barriers to support within. Uh, I think you were mentioning specifically uh, the cultural development fund and and other things. Uh, you know talk to us about what that actually means in, in, in uh, getting more money uh, to uh, uh, BIPOC-led uh, organizations, BIPOC communities, and, and, and increasing the pool even eligible to receive those funds. I assume that's what you're, you're, you're talking about in some way, but, but when you say in your testimony you're eliminating barriers to support, what, what does that mean and how, how is it that actually working? So this is a study that um, has taken a, a few years and we just received um, you know, the recommendations. Um, it's not only about the amount of money, it's about you know, the process in which you access money and how that could be 
inequitable to smaller organizations. Um, a couple of examples of that, you know, that may seem trivial, but they're important. And this is something that I myself heard, you know, um, while I was running cultural organizations as important is from allowing um, smaller organizations to receive multi-year grants. And there was always a question if, if you give a small organization a multi-year grant, their possibilities of increasing the amount of um, a fund that they get year to year is um, less than if you continue to um, 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 apply uh, every year, right? But at the same time, there's so many other benefits that come, but knowing that for the next three years, you're gonna have that money coming in from um, DCLA. Um, that's one of the many examples, examples of um, simplifying and facilitating the application process, um, even um, neighborhood borough-based um, um, sort of submission of you know, the paperwork, um, hopefully moving into a paper base to um, something digital online. Um, those are a few of the examples of uh, the recommendations that come forward. Got it. Um... So I have uh, uh, many more questions, but I know that um, uh, Majority Leader Cumbo and others do as well, and I want to uh, uh, move the discussion along. So um, I, I may be back, but uh, you know, I just want to say I think we have a lot more to do, and I know there are challenges for you in particular, Commissioner uh, Casals, within the, the context of the moment and as administration. But um, you know, I. I I know that, uh, that you feel this in a very personal way and we need to do better. Uh, with that, I wanna ask if Majority Leader Cumbo is ready to begin. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Van Bramer. And I really wanna thank you for organizing this really important panel. We really haven't had a hearing specifically focused on race in this way. And so I really wanna thank you for your leadership um, and bringing this forward, when I saw this um, on the calendar, I was just like, this is brilliant. This is certainly a conversation we need to have. Um, just, th there's so many thoughts that I have around this topic and conversation when I don't even really know where to begin because it, 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 it certainly begins before COVID and it certainly begins, um, so many of these conversations have been had prior to this, but I think that COVID and the Black Lives Matter movement certainly pushed it up to the forefront um, in everyone's face in that way. And so, you know, when we're talking about Black Lives Matter, when we're talking about defund NYPD, when we're talking about the disparities that we experienced and witnessed in COVID and everyone's searching for answers, a lot of focus was placed on um, the NYPD as far as answers, um, the Board of Education in terms of education. But I think for me, and I think many artistic and cultural practitioners and, and the artist community, I think we really know that the solution to all of the issues that everyone is talking about really begins with the work of the cultural community. And I feel that what we're seeing play out from COVID to the Black Lives Matter movement is that throughout our, our culture here in the United States and, and abroad, there are decisions made every day about one culture is inferior to another culture. One culture <clears throat> is superior, one's inferior, one's a minority, one's a majority, one matters, one doesn't matter. If we have to make life and death situations or decisions, um, whose lives do we value? And in the cultural community, I feel like we have such an incredible opportunity as well as responsibility to be able to address and to start that work about how do we bring all of the cultures that make up New York City, let's just focus on New York City, how do we bring all of them up to a level playing field so that people recognize that all cultures, races, religions, have something very valuable that everyone should value so that everyone's lives and everyone's culture matters. Now, you have, I suspect, 14 months left in this position. Uh, many of us as council members are term limited out, but I think it's important that 
we address those questions and get to those fundamental um, issues. When we talk about the Department of Cultural Affairs, I, I feel very much that a lot of this work that the world is talking about begins with us and how we're going to respond to it. And so, you know, when we look at the Department of Cultural Affairs, we can look at it from a funding perspective, sure. We recognize that organizations of color, and I'm sure Black organizations, if, if we were to do a, a, a value analysis, would recognize that those organizations are systemically underfunded. If we were to look at the CIG roster and to look at how that money is distributed, we would see that the, the organizations of color and black organizations are the least funded within that organization. But on top of that, they are also a minority uh, within that organizational structure. There are so many disparities that we're seeing um, when we had the hearing that Ch Chair Van Bramer brought forward about um, tourism in New York City. I have yet to see an amazing tourism plan that celebrates and promotes the organizations of color, black organizations and the outer boroughs in a way that brings that level of tourism here to New York City. And so there, there's so much that needs to be done. I, I also have recognized the importance of partnerships. How do we create partnerships with the larger organizations and larger in terms of staffing facility, but not necessarily in mission because the missions of these organizations are all equal, but how do we put that work together so that larger organizations are partnering with smaller and size organizations to build them up together? So I, I guess my question to you, I, I have a lot of thoughts, but my <laughs> question is, the world is looking at New York City and it's hard to recognize when a world is looking at New York City because we're sheltering in place. We're like, who's looking at me in my living room? But it's like the world is looking at us for leadership. And what do you think is the most revolutionary thing? Because this is a revolution that's happening right now. It's, it, it doesn't look, you know, when we read about revolutions, the Revolutionary War, it, it looked very different in terms of what we visually saw, but we're in a revolutionary time right now. And what do you think is the revolutionary movement, that bold movement that cities and countries all over the world ha are looking at as far as Department of Cultural Affairs? We need a revolution of ideas, a revolution of approaches. What is it that you feel DCLA has put forward that answers that call from the world what is New York City doing in this perspective? Good morning. Um, <laughs> there's so much. <laughs> I don't know where to start. Um, You're I'll, like, I'll what start. coffee are you drinking? <laughs> <laughs> I'll start and then you, um, if I don't answer your question fully, um, you direct me with other questions. Um, um, let's take um, one step at a time. Um, I completely agree with you that in addition to um, being a public funder, the agency is and could be so much more. And that's part of work that I'm doing internally with the staff to really elevate you know, the power of this agency to be an advocate and to be a convener for the, the sector. Um, and we can talk on detail you know, what that means. Um, and, and really also emphasize this idea of public-private partnerships because it is in moments like these that we realize that the city alone um, cannot do the work that needs to happen. Um, number two, um, in terms of, um, unlike you know, private philanthropy, um, um, we move um, really slow. So it's really difficult um, for us, right? Having a year long um, granting process having you know, um, a, a, a budget that tights you know, for, for a full year to be able to change things you know, really quickly um, on our track. That's why I, com I continue to insist in long-term you know, structural change. And an example, and this is something that um, my predecessor had worked with you for, for many years, is you know, the work that we're doing um, as an example in, with Southside um, in, in Brooklyn, right? in which um, there were two, the public library and BAM were coming in and we were able to also make room for two um, by POC led um, culture organizations, um, Mocada and 651 Arts. 
right? Sort of we're constantly looking at what are the opportunities in which we can help, you know, culture organizations, not only with them giving them funding, but also helping them build wealth, right? By owning their own buildings and by just having a much more sustainable situation. Um, in terms of uh, tourism, it's actually, um, it is a great moment, you know, for um, cultural organizations outside Manhattan because um, New York City and Co. is really focusing on the idea of um, hyperlocal. And through their all in campaign, they're inviting cultural organizations and offering them a toolkit in which they can participate and really um, promote their. Um, their offerings, um, you know, to New Yorkers that are willing to uh, travel from borough to borough because um, th they have nothing else, um, nowhere else to go. And in terms of um, sort of the big idea and the big model, um, um, it is our hope that we're going to do um, an, another round of um, surveying uh, after six months of um, the situation of the cultural organizations and continue to work with private philanthropy to see how um, the data that we collect can help them inform you know their priorities in terms of recovery for the cultural sector let me um jump in there because i know i have limited time i just wanted to understand with there's a lot of discussion on the philanthropic side that i'm hearing but the conversations that I'm hearing, a lot of this corporate philanthropy seems to be happening in the for-profit sector. So I love my businesses. I love my small businesses. I love my restaurants. I love I love all of that, the, the, the businesses, but there does not seem to be this corporate conversation um, around the cultural institutions or the not-for-profit sector. So I'm hearing a lot of conversations from organizations like Goldman Sachs. Um, here in Brooklyn, New York, the Brooklyn Nets are talking about these conversations. I'm getting wind of a lot of these conversations, but it's very difficult to interject, not difficult for me to interject it, but it, it seems like there's not a space or window in these conversations for the cultural and not-for-profit community. Have you had success, real communications? Is something going to be rolled out with Goldman Sachs, Ford Foundation, Citigroup, and these groups, all of these, I'm just throwing out stuff that you know are saying, we recognize that the Black Lives Matter movement has happened and we want to step up to the plate in a real meaningful way. Have you seen, have you participated, I've have you? Yes and no. I just want to make um, a, a, a draw a line between corporate and foundation. Um, you know, um, foundations have been doing a lot of work, and we're constantly in conversations, like you know, sometimes um, weekly, about you know the priorities, about how the future looks like, how do we move from um, relief to recovery. Um, I have not had conversations with a uh, corporate philanthropy. I think that's important. Now, let me ask you a question because wearing my cultural hat from years ago, I understand my cultural hat and now I understand my political hat better. Um, some of those worlds can get lost in conversations. So they can have conversation and conversation and conversation. At a certain point, somebody's got to write a check and pull the trigger. Are these corporations or rather foundations and organizations are they pooling their resources in a meaningful way that's providing that level of support that particularly organizations of color can benefit from? Yes, um, and I can just uh, point out uh, three examples. There is, um, you know, I'm sorry? No, that would be great if you could provide examples yeah, because, early because on, we as electeds, we also want to get this information out to our groups as well. And if something like this is happening, I need to be able to promote it. Early on, um, the um, New York Community Trust, you know, pull, create a consortium of foundations to do the first round of relief that um, I know they help a lot of um, smaller cultural organizations and they're really good at um, sort of um, equitable practices. Both uh, Ford and Mellon continue to offer um, millions and millions of dollars in recovery. Um, lately, um, and this is something that um, Chair Van Bremer brought up, brought up as important, um, the Miller Foundation announced $250 million towards um, monuments and you know, markers. Um, so foundations are like really um, going um, beyond you know, the call of duty 
to um to just to react to um, the needs of um, of the cultural sector. Many of these, um, with the section of New York Community Trust, are like national um, level foundations, and sort of um, part of the work I'm trying to do is to make sure that they remember that they're in New York and that they remember how important, as you said, you know, in terms of leadership and modeling for the rest of the world, the uh, cultural sector in New York City is. I think that's great. And I think it's also great to be able to get that information out as best as you can also to the elected officials so that, because monuments are huge also for me. I, I know that for the last seven years, I've been trying to get monuments built in my district, particularly for the parks within my district. So like, for example, we just did the, prior to COVID, the Betty Carter Park. And so I wanted to have a sculpture in recognition of her. I also wanted to do one um, in Ebbets Field for Jackie Robinson and others, these types of monuments, but it seems like it's more logistic and paperwork and stories about why it can't happen. It'd be easier to build a skyscraper than to build a, a monument <laughs> to Betty Carter, the way this process has been laid out for us. I just, you know, and, and this is, I didn't have the opportunity to answer to a comment that Chair Van Bremer made before, um, and this is um, um, no shade to anyone, but, uh, you know, we were talking about uh, processes by the state, and processes by the city, right? The, there's a difference between a political process and a civic process, right? And today we're able to talk about Beanie's um, project because there was significant community involvement um, to the point that the community was the one decided, you know, what 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 was the monument that what was the um, art who was the artist and what was the project that needed to go up, and that takes time. That is messy, but at the end of the day, um, it shields you know much better results than just a closed door um, process that could happen in no time. Um, just wanted to ask one more question and then close with a statement. Um, there was a lot of discussion. Um, Chair Van Bramer hosted a really great hearing with um, Council Member Fernando Cabrera in discussions about the creation of the first African-American history museum um, in New York City. And I know that there has been some discussion about that. I think that would also be a tremendous opportunity with New York City having one of, if not the largest population of Black people outside of the continent of Africa and Brazil. Has there been discussion about um, that particular museum in regards to uh, the Black Lives Matter movement? Yes, and uh, unfortunately, I cannot remember exactly at what stage that project is, but I can get back exactly to you. Um, you know, well, of course, it's in very early stages, but I can get back to you exactly where we are on that. I think for New York City, that would be a huge step in the right direction to addressing all of these systemic issues that we're talking about, because it. Education is not a, a quick fix and education is not the band-aid that I guess people are looking for right now. Education is, it, it, it's systems being put in place that take a long time to see the results of. But I feel like in this administration, we have to put that work into effect to make it happen. But I, I'll just close with saying, to me, what the Black Lives Matter movement in many ways represented is that we have to systematically look at our existing systems and work to figure out how do we create real solutions that are bold, different, revolutionary, as far as how the issues that this movement brought to the forefront. So when we look at black cultural institutions, when we look at institutions of color, I believe it's critical that the Department of Cultural Affairs come up with a revolutionary way to answer the calls of the Black Lives Matter movement um, that answer the calls of the defund NYPD movement where those movements were talking about how do we reinvest in more meaningful ways in our communities and to end the over-criminalization and over-policing of communities of color. Now, those are the fundamental ideals of those, of those goals, but we have to figure out through arts and culture, 
how do we have the real conversations where we're in rooms for hours and weeks and months on end to figure out how can the cultural community be a major player in the public safety of New York City? And I feel like that is a huge conversation that people aren't putting together. That public safety is in so many ways wrapped around cultural understandings, cultural respect, inclusion, tolerance, understanding. We've got to get that into the forefront of the conversation because that's the real conversation. There's a lot of protests and rallies and marches and that's great, but we have to figure out where, where does the rubber meet the road on those very important issues. So I'll just, I'm, I'm still looking for something bold from the Department of Cultural Affairs to answer that. I wanna be at that press conference when we roll it out. And I wanna, I wanna be at the forefront and, and be the most excited champion and cheerleader for that. Um, I'll end there and, and I'll turn it back over to Chair Van Bramer. Thank you very much, uh, Majority Leader, for um, your, your passion and, and your voice. In, in all of this work. Um, I just wanna say, uh, Gonzalo, uh, Commissioner Casals, um, you can always throw shade the governor's way at my committee <laughs> hearings. Uh, do not in any way apologize for that. Uh, I agree with you that how they do monuments is very different than how we do monuments, but I think the frustration about the pace and, and the delay of, of important uh, works uh, like Benny Bagwell's is real, right? I mean, you you are absolutely correct that when you have a politically driven uh, monument process, boy, it can get done lightning fast. But that does not negate the frustration, the very real frustration, about what's happening with the the city uh, efforts that are more uh, inclusive of of community input and voices. So I just want to um, say that uh, I assume that shade was directed the governor's way. Do not answer uh, unless you feel free uh, to answer that question. The second, I want to just say this, you know, and it gets a little bit to the majority leaders, you know, big thinking. And this is me speaking personally. But, you know, when we talk about corporate philanthropy, you know, I just want to remind everyone that, you know, the the wealthiest billionaires in this country have had their net worth grow uh, by uh, a trillion dollars uh, since COVID began. And that is obscene and immoral. And while Goldman Sachs and Citigroup and others have corporate philanthropy, and that's good, if we just taxed billionaires and corporations in the way that they should be taxed, uh, then we would have the resources that we need uh, to actually fund uh, the programs and the services. And we could uh, at least attempt to do it far more equitably. Uh, and, you know, I just want to uh, quote uh, Ibram Kendi, who wrote uh, that you can't be anti-racist without being anti-capitalist. And uh, I, I believe that and I'm, you know, it is appalling that we talk about resources and we have conversations about resources. And, and then we know that Jeff Bezos and all of these billionaires have had uh, incredible, incredible gains uh, in their net worths. Um, several people gaining hundreds of billions of dollars while uh, so many uh, people uh, in particular, BIPOC communities have suffered and lost. And I think we have to come to a moment of reckoning in this country about that too, right? And, and that is all related to the conversation that we are having today, that we live in a country where five men uh, are worth hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars. And the vast majority of people in this country uh, don't have enough to eat and can't pay the rent. And, and that is uh, a part of the structural racism that, that we are talking about today. Uh, so I just wanted to um, mention that and throw that into this part of the discussion. Um, 
I know that council member Inez Barron has joined uh, the hearing and I wanna recognize uh, council member Barron and see if there are any other council members that have uh, questions for Commissioner Casals before we move on to hearing from members of the public and the cultural community, which I'm anxious to uh, have that dialogue. So uh, Brenda and others will let me know if there are any other council members. Commissioner Casals, do you have any uh, closing words before we potentially move on? Um, I continue to, um, as majority leader said, we only um, have uh, 14 more months, um, probably the three of us to work together and to the sense of urgency that comes because of the pandemic and the reckoning with um, racial injustice in our society. There's a sense of urgency of, you know, how much longer the three of us are going to be around. And I just want to continue to work with the two of you. In making this a priority for for all of us. Yes. Well, I hope the three of us are going to be around for decades and decades and decades to come. But obviously, we will be in these positions uh, for uh, a finite period of time. And uh, yes, uh, we all want to make uh, the most of this moment. Have it be as as uh, productive and and worthy of the moment as possible. Uh, so, uh, if there are no other questions from council members, uh, we will move on to the first public panel and our council I, will... I think yes. the majority leader wants to say something. Oh, okay. Time starts now. You're on there. I've gotten a new computer, so I'm, I'm learning. And, and I, I just want to say, I think that one of the inspiring things that I have seen have been those murals, um, the ability to see the Black Lives Matter movement um, just all over our streets and bringing together people in um, unimaginable ways. I think that DCLA needs to continue to work to see how many of these spaces can be made permanent. Um, permanent gathering spaces so that this is not a temporary. But I also want to say at the same time, it shows it shows those murals and the ability to paint our streets showed what is possible. Prior to COVID, if I had said I wanted to paint a street Black Lives Matter, the amount of paperwork and bureaucracy that would have happened that would have made it impossible to do. It's exciting to see how the will of the people can move and can change things. And I think it's important for people to continue to raise their voices in that way, because that shows that it matters, um, that that voice matters. But at the same time, I don't want any of us to become satisfied or complacent with the fact that painting the streets is what we were asking for. Those are really symbolic gestures that are symbolic of the history and the period and time, but they are in no way um, an answer or solution to the systemic issues that are really um, bubbling far beneath the ground of, of the streets that they are painted on. So the murals, the portraits, the statues are, are wonderful and necessary, but the, the, the deep rooted work still needs to happen and and i'm going to continue to work these next 14 months along with chair van bramer and the rest of the members on this committee and as well with you commissioner to see to it that we leave these positions in a better place and better footing for the next generation of new leaders that we've set a strong foundation and that's so important to me because the people that are on this call are all gonna be doing this work for the rest of their lives because we're just crazy that way and we're wired and built that way. So, you know, we're gonna be on the next level of Zooms 20 years from now doing something related to this work. So it's important that we set that foundation now. Yes, I don't think it's crazy, uh, Majority Leader. I think it's uh, exactly what we were born to do, but thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, I think uh, 
uh, Council Member Barron has raised her hand. Um, if Council Member Barron is uh, ready to speak. Um, yes. There we go, Council Member Barron. Time thank starts you. now. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel. I didn't have the opportunity to be able to hear the testimony. You know, Zoom has created, in fact, the opportunity for us to actually be in two places at the same time. So I was here <laughs> in another place and did not get an opportunity to uh, hear. But my question, as everyone knows, I've come in talking about the inequity and the injustices that Black people have experienced historically. So that's nothing new. So just to get quickly, and perhaps it's already something that has been addressed in terms of the commitment to Vinnie Burroughs, was that addressed and do we have a timetable and when will that happen? Because we don't want it to linger. So if you could quickly respond, I see you nodding your head. So if you could quickly yes. answer. So, um, I, I mentioned it before, um, the, uh, that project is on pause now, is one of our priorities to um, restart. It is my hope that it'll restart soon, um, you know, contracting and, you know, and then design, um, sort of a construction design. And my hope is that um, by um, um, next year, we're going to be seeing um, that and a few other um, monuments um, happening. So has she been given a contract? Has it been signed? Is all no. of that? No, and um, what I explained before is um, when COVID hit, um, the, the contract negotiations between this, the contractor and EDC, who's the agency is going to be managing this project, were starting. That got on pause. Um, the next step is to start those conversations again. Um, once that contract is signed, then there's going to be a contract. So do, you, do you have a date, a timeline that you could tell me that I could expect that that would happen? No, um, again, so why can't we get a date? Why can't we get a fat, hard and fast target date for that to happen? For the uh, project to restart? Because for the contract uh, to be signed. Because the project hasn't restarted, it's still on pause. By, you know, um, like I mentioned before, it's, um, OMB is prioritizing COVID related capital projects and uh, projects that have already um, been in construction. Right. Con okay, so thank you. Mr. Chair, I would, I would urge us as a committee uh, within the city council to push that, to get a firm date because we are talking about the injustices that we have been subjected to and uh, all due respect to all the panelists here, we need a date to be able to say we understand and we wanna make sure that we're gonna take an action that will in fact uh, guarantee that this will happen. We don't wanna have, oh, it can't happen. You know, we're gonna, so I, I would urge this committee to push for a target date for that contract to be signed so that we can be sure that that goes forward. Uh, and I just wanna encourage everybody to, to realize that this is an opportunity for us to change what has existed. Uh, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of symbolism. And now we wanna make sure that when we come through this on the other side, that our cultural institutions, in fact, have a presentation and a, a demonstration that we acknowledge that our libraries, our museums, and other cultural institutions have not gotten their fair share. And I do have to go back to, uh, to the fight that was waged by our predecessors, particularly my husband when he was a council member to fight because he was the one that made it an issue. No, there's not equitable funding here. So we've got to do that, lay that groundwork, build on that and pass it on to those who are coming behind so that it can be concretized and we can see tangible demonstrations of the push and the move towards getting that kinds of uh, representation that talks about all of the things that we've contributed in so many facets of, of our culture and understanding culture is more than just the arts, it's our language, it's our history, it's all of those things that define us as a people. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to be able to share. Thank you. Council Member Barron, thank you very much. And I want to assure you that I asked the commissioner two rounds of questions about uh, this particular uh, piece. And I agree that uh, the administration's uh, uh, pause here is uh, absolutely insufficient and we need a commitment and you're correct that we need dates and we need 
uh, uh, a contract. Uh, Vinny is uh, going to be speaking soon and testifying um, uh, herself. Uh, and, and we're thrilled to have her here and we will continue to push, um, you know, while uh, I'm no big fan of the governor, I did reference that uh, uh, there was a statue of uh, Mother Cabrini um, uh, commissioned and built within a year. Uh, and uh, this uh, a very, very important uh, piece of work is on pause by the Office of Management and Budget without any uh, timeline of restarting. So uh, uh, Commissioner Casals knows uh, how we feel and I, I uh, believe uh, uh, he wants to get this done, but, uh, and I also asked him in his conversations with the mayor and uh, we've just got to get it done. And, uh, and uh, Commissioner Casals, uh, maybe you want to address uh, some of Councilmember Barron's uh, concerns, but, but also the the importance of doing this. I, I saw your, you gave uh, Councilmember Barron, a, a, I suppose a bit of a timeline in next year, but uh, maybe you can uh, speak to some of the specifics. I cannot tell you a timeline again until you know the project starts, but uh, by um, risking of boring all of you, you know, I work in East Holland at El Museo del Barrio for eight years. I gave a lot of tours that would point out at that monument and the injustices of that monument. And I was instrumental at the, um, um, when I was part of the uh, monument commission that the mayor had put together in making sure that that monument was taken down. Um, this is not a way of defending you know, the position of the administration or you know, um, to ease the frustrations that we all have of you know, this project not moving forward. But it's a way to let, it, let you know that I'm very much behind um, this project and I'm doing everything I can in order to uh, make it happen. Uh, is Councilmember Barron uh, raising her hand? Just, Would you like to speak? Just for the, yes, just for the yeah. record, Vinnie Bagwell, not Vinnie Burroughs. Thank you. <laughs> Someone alerted me, I used the wrong name. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Um, and unless, uh, I'm alerted that there are other council members who wish to speak. Uh, I believe uh, Vinnie Bagwell is on the first panel and uh, we can hear uh, directly uh, from the artist and some uh, other folks. So uh, uh, committee council, if you'd like to uh, take it from there. Uh, Commissioner Casals, we will be following up obviously, but uh, I thank you for being a part of this important conversation and pushing the administration uh, to do better. Thank you so much, Chair Van Brammer. And correct, we do not see any other council member hands. If there are any other council members that would like to ask a question, if you can please raise your hand now just to double check. We're not seeing any other hands. So we will move to the public portion of this hearing. So now that we have concluded the administration's testimony, uh, we will turn to the public testimony. I would like to remind everyone uh, that individuals will be called up in panels. So for members of the public, please wait until your name is called. So we've noticed a few people raising their hand um, in the Zoom and uh, we'll call on you um, first as part of a panel and then individually. Council members, if you have questions for a particular panelist, please use the raise hand function in Zoom and you'll be called on after everyone in a panel has completed their testimony in the order that you raised your hand. There are approximately four individuals per panel. For panelists and members of the public, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. All testimony will be limited to three minutes today. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. So we will begin with the first panel now. And in order of speaking, this panel will be Melody Capote, Shade Lithcott, Vinny Bagwell, and Atiba Edwards. So I will call on you one, on, one at a time. The first panelist and witness from the public is Melody Capote. Your time starts now. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the City Council and Commissioner Casals. My name is Melody Capote, Executive Director of the Caribbean Cultural Center African Diaspora Institute. I still can't breathe. 
I appeared before you in June and told you then I can't breathe. And to my great embarrassment, nothing was done. Well, I still can't breathe because after George Floyd's murder, more of my relatives have been killed for living while black. I ask you this, if Breonna Taylor were your daughter, would you be able to breathe? I still can't breathe because I still have to have the talk with my black son who believes that it, that is death by law enforcement can't happen to him, yet I know better. I still can't breathe because the city council and the administration speak about the special role of arts and culture in healing a community whose culture has been stolen from them only to find that those, that stolen culture is on display somewhere in a Fifth Avenue museum. Here's what we as an organization have done since June. We are just finishing a series of workshops on anti-racism in the arts and culture. We're presently today in, a, in our session, in a closing session. To date, we have trained 100 arts and cultural executives representing 60 organizations. 85% of which are white. So I challenge you to step up to the plate and honor George Floyd and the other martyrs. And in their name, I ask that you, one, establish a special capacity building fund for organizations of color with a budget of under $5 million who will be required to use their grant to address racial and social injustice. Fund on a pilot basis an artist curator, uh, incubator, I'm sorry, an artist incubator, which will train artists of color to provide arts and culture services using the new digital platforms and assist artists to develop entrepreneurial ventures through culturally competent technical assistance. And lastly, fund on a negotiated basis, the Institute for Racial and Social Justice for Arts and Culture housed presently at the Caribbean Cultural Center African Diaspora Institute, because that is where the work is being done. Our community needs you to put your money where your words are. I close with a new phrase being used by the NYPD, collaborative reimagination or collaborative reimagining. If you want to do this work, don't ask us to testify, instead, Ask us to sit at the table as equal partners uh, to reimagine and collaborative, collaboratively negotiate the new package. Thank you for your time. And yes, Black lives do matter. Thank you, Melody, um, for your work and, and for always being a part of these uh, discussions. Uh, I, I wanted to ask Commissioner Casals, um, uh, relative to Melody's uh, recommendations, uh, capacity building fund, do you have any uh, thoughts on that particular uh, first recommendation of Melody from the department's perspective? We are, um, <clears throat> as the um, Majority leader said, you know, like um, the situation which you live in open up some, um, you know, opportunity to change, you know, some policies that, you know, otherwise um, you would not be able to do. And we're considering um, as a pilot experience and as part of, you know, um, the, um, the, the barriers to access to um, public fund if, you know, a por at least a portion or the totality of a CDF um, grants could go to um, GOS and not to service to the public, uh, which could be a huge, um, um, in a moment like this, could be a huge support to um, cultural organizations and open up the, the opportunity to support other projects like um, building capacity for the organization. Sure, but could the department uh, do more and and allocate more very specifically towards uh, capacity building uh, uh, for and by BIPOC organizations? In addition to um, what I just said, which is a general sort of uh, funds that go for CDF, very much like what we did in the past with the SIAP uh, money, which was an, an added um, um, 
funds to um, organizations in neighborhoods that we felt that needed the most, usually aligns with um, culturally specific organizations working in cultural specific um, neighborhoods. Um, we're doing a portion of the funds um, um, as part of a COVID relief and another one as part of arts education relief, understanding you know, that those um, are two of the places in which um, organizations have been hard, hardest hit. Chair Van Braver, uh, I think you're on mute still. Thank you for pointing that out, both of you. Um, it, so do you, do you and um, uh, Melody talk uh, about uh, these issues and, and are you open to the suggestions that Melody uh, uh, talks about? And, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's yeah, important I, that we get to a... Just to just to clarify, right? You know, the, our our grants are not sort of prescribing. You know, one can use um, if anybody wants to use the CDF um, money for you know capacity, cultural capacity like that, uh, they can do so. Um, we also have uh, been more flexible in in this time. If somebody apply in February for um, money uh, for a specific project. And they decide to go otherwise. There's an opportunity to change the scope. So um, we're, we're always open to this kind of work. It doesn't have to be necessarily a specific um, to um, to CDF. But we will continue to uh, have that discussion. Um, uh, we have to move on to our next panelist. But obviously, Melody, I always uh, appreciate you bringing. Um, uh, fierce, uh, um, challenging comments uh, to our, our, our hearings. Thank you. The next panelist will be Shade Lithcott. Time starts now. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer, Majority Leader Cumbo, Commissioner Hall, and all of the city council members at DCLA present today. My name is Shade Lithcott. I testify today as the CEO of the National Black Theater, the oldest continually run Black theater in New York. I'm also a, proudly the chair of coalitions of theaters of color, a coalition that represents the largest body of culturally specific theaters in the city, representing 52 cultural institutions across all five boroughs, each year serving millions of New Yorkers with vitally needed cultural, educational, social, and economic resources and opportunities for youth, seniors, families, and local neighborhoods, and to the broader residents living in the outer boroughs. These are the same people and communities who have suffered systemic underinvestment and oppression that has resulted in the overwhelming and disproportionate number of deaths from COVID-19 and from the front lines of police brutality and structural racism. I must say publicly on the record, we are grateful in particular to Chair Van Bramer, Majority Leader Lori Cumbo and the members of Black for the preservation and growth of this initiative over the past three years, especially in the last budget cycle. I would argue they shouldn't have had to fight so hard to preserve the only source of culturally specific funding to the arts. Respectfully, I am fatigued as these conversations continue to be unbalanced, centering predominantly white institutions deficits instead of equally offering sustainable solutions and investment for BIPOC communities, which is a form of supremacy. These systems of power grant privilege and access unequally such that inequities and injustice are the result and that must continually be addressed and changed. Action steps that I would put forward. Our city must take concrete actionable steps, not just recognize, but to protect its culturally specific institutions, especially those located in and serving its vulnerable communities uh, with the inclusion of our institution into baseline funding, creating secure funding for the communities that have been systemically disenfranchised, marginalized, and historically oppressed. Adding next, adding justice to all diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. It is not enough to just try to shift 
uh, white organizations and institutions, but justice must sit at the center of this work. Rec next, recognize and eliminate systemic racism and other barriers to fair and just distribution of resources, access, and opportunities by auditing, acknowledging, I'm and expired. dismantling inequities with policy systems, programs, and services. In conclusion, Black Lives Matter. But Black Lives Matter is not a moment. I would argue it's not even a movement. Black Lives Matter is a value proposition. It is about taking accountability and dismantling structural inequities that keep our people, communities, and institutions on the margin struggling for basic survival. From the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 to the murder of George Floyd, the city must play a vital role in creating economic parity, justice, and making our communities whole. Anything less is contributing to the problem. Won't you commit to being a, being a part of the solution? Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for uh, all your work. Uh, and as you stated, we fought uh, very hard, uh, in particular, the majority leader and myself for Coalition of Theaters of Color um, saw uh, an incredible increase uh, two years ago, not this past year, and then um, did not cut uh, any of the funding this year. Uh, you are right that it shouldn't be such a big fight. Um, and uh, I absolutely uh, support your recommendations and um, uh, believe in baselining uh, all of this funding. Uh, obviously, there is a second player in this part, which is the administration and, and the mayor and the Department of Cultural Affairs. So, um, uh, so I absolutely support and will uh, fight for all of those things that you mentioned um, with the majority leader in this committee. And I will ask Commissioner Casals if he would like to uh, respond to those recommendations as well on behalf of the mayor. I don't think I have uh, much more to add. I'm just um, gonna stay in the hearing and just taking notes and just hear from um, the, the sector. Okay. Uh, but baselining, uh, do you support baselining? I realize you don't uh, have to respond to questions from the public, but, uh, but I, I, I'm happy when I have something to say. I'm happy to respond, and you know, if, if I'm gonna stay, I'll, I'll play along. Um, I need to, um, I need to um, talk to my team, and I need to um, um, sort of um, think think that through um, before I can say something about that. Okay, but you're open to it, and and we'll continue to have uh, discussions about that. Yep. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, not exactly all the answers that you were looking for there, but I appreciate um, you uh, calling the questions and and uh, holding people, uh, including me, me and Commissioner Casals accountable. Uh, next, who's speaking next? The next panelist will be Vinnie Bagwell. Time starts now. Good morning. <clears throat> Pardon me. Good morning, Chairman Van Bramer and city council members, uh, the community at large. I, I wanna thank you for bringing this topic to the fore for the support of art in public places and enabling the community to have a voice. This is excellent. I, I wanna begin by expressing my deepest gratitude, frankly, to Mayor Bill de Blasio and the First Lady Charlene McRae for creating an endowed pathway for new public art that represents marginalized people and that reflects our evolving culture in New York City. I, I am the artist who will be creating Victory to replace the J. Marion Sims sculpture on Fifth Avenue. And the architect, Bryce Turner, and I appreciate the opportunity to employ our work um, as an innovative method of historical preservation, education, and advancement and equity for the city of New York. I, I also want to express my heartfelt thanks, my heartfelt thanks um, to the Honorable Inez uh, Barron, Ward 11, uh, the community at large for their collective advocacy of my work. I'm here today to support the improvements for the Percent for Public Art program, particularly as it pertains to public art about history of people of color. 
um, experience has informed me of what best practices look like for public art competitions. I created the first public artwork of a contemporary African-American woman to be commissioned by a municipality in the United States. I've been finalist for 36 times. I've won 20 more commissions in the last 10 years. In the public art arena, we've been discussing the need for diversity for a number of years. I've been a keynote speaker for best practices for the American of the arts, their annual, semi-annual conventions. I've also won their inaugural George and Darlene Perez Prize for civic engagement. <clears throat> On topic, um, I sincerely, sincerely hope that the city of New York retains all the budgets and lifts the suspension for the She Built NYC, Victory, the Lions Family, Tito Puente, and the other commissions that pertain to the history of people of color because as the largest repository of public art in the country and the capital of the art world, the voice of artists in New York is more important now than ever. According to research data, the most successful public art projects involve both the artists and the community at the onset of the project to encourage a sense of shared ownership and collective affiliation. Did that not happen for me for victory? The effort of creating art for public places is not solitary. Of course, these days, virtual attendance is, is becoming the norm and New York City must set a higher standard for community participation. With the Victory Commission, there was a significant disconnect between the actual online comments and what was shared with the participants at the finalist presentation. Acknowledging and respecting the voice of the community is imperative and keeping them involved in the process is my mantra. And communication is key. Carefully conceive public art and carefully conceive public art installations. Time expired. Stop. No, keep going, keep going, Benny. Okay, my point is, let me be real direct. I feel in the name of diversity, New York City must work harder on setting higher standard for leading the charge for inclusion and the representation of people of color in the public art realm in this city. Relative to the impact of the pandemic, I am prayerful for the new leadership of our nation. And I expect with that change, New York will receive the fiscal uh, support it deserves and needs. Meanwhile, Your Honor, the victory beyond Sims Public Art Commission outcome and the outcry from the community are the reason that the Department of Cultural Affairs was called on the carpet by the Oversight Committee. The former commissioner quit his job the day after finals. Thus, it took four months to even have our first two meetings. And most of that time in those two meetings were spent shooting down the design and imposing a deconstruction of design. They are calling for major adjustments to design, a bias for style on this subject on the part of cultural affairs and the design committee seems more than apparent. Pandemic began more than five months after the announcement of the winner. It is an excuse for procrastination now. I believe there are things that can be done. Mr. Casals, it's nice to make your acquaintance. Finally, you've been in office for more than six months and you have not reached out to me, not once, to even introduce yourself or declare your commitment as a person of color yourself to continue the important commissions for people of color in this city. Why are we, why haven't we met? For information, I always have to reach out twice. It takes days, sometimes weeks before your director gets back to me. Robert's Rules is 48 hours. The media has been more forthcoming with information coming out of your office. I've had hour long discussions with news anchors and writers for the New York Times and Time magazines. Can you confirm that the funding is secure? I can't seem to get an answer to that question. Even with the suspension of public art, why can't we at least begin the process of negotiating an agreement because I can almost guarantee you that will, that right there is gonna take quite a bit of time going back and forth. When will you be setting the date for to begin a negotiation? There are a lot of things we can do while you're waiting for pandemic to pass. And by the way, regarding my governor, you've been not saying nothing bad about my governor. This man had his office call me on day two to make me an essential business so that I could finish public art. Mother Cabrini got done in six months. That is unprecedented in the public art world. Now I understand you guys do it differently than the state, but the point that I'm making is that I disagree. I do not think that the Office of Cultural Affairs is doing enough. You can use your finger and dial and talk. You can at least start with talking. Even if your hands are bound and gagged for initiating the actual execution of the agreement, we can talk. I would appreciate that much for starters. I look forward to advancing the vision of the city of New York. 
by creating this artwork. And I just think it's so important to inform viewers that artistry is a powerful and useful tool of social transformation. It's capable of condensing our thoughts, distilling our minds, and renewing our hopes and aspirations. I really appreciate the extra time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so with respect to, to Victory uh, and your, um, your work here, when is the last, what is sort of the, the last uh, concrete discussion you've had with the Department of Cultural Affairs or, or this administration? And, and uh, as Councilmember Barron was talking about, right, there's, there's no contract, right? There, we're, we seem to be stuck at a very early stage here with respect to even you, the artist. February 4th, 2020 is the last meeting that we had. February 4th, 2020. Again, I understand reality. I have not badgered. I've laid back. I haven't said much. I check in every now and to say, hey, how's it going? What are we doing? Kendall Henry's response is, you'll know when we know. Well, evidently you don't know. But it doesn't mean that we can't start negotiating the contract. I have been negotiating the contract with the city of Norfolk for eight months. It takes a while. The language isn't always fair and equitable for the artist when you're talking to municipalities. Oftentimes, municipality, it's always me, 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 me. It's all about you. So I don't expect the city of New York to be much different. I am probably going to need some adjustment to that agreement. Why can't I get a hard copy, a draft? to at least go over with my attorney. If it's perfect and it's great, fine. Then we'll wait for you to say, let's execute. But to wait until you're ready to execute and then have to take another year and a century to negotiate the contract is not a good use of the time. That's my point. Thank you. Um, uh, Commissioner, uh, I understand you You uh, probably aren't interested in, in uh, uh, discussing uh, all of the internals about this, but this is a very important, uh, let me just finish uh, Commissioner Casales. This is a very important piece of work, as you know, right? Replacing uh, a, a horrific uh, a statue uh, honoring a horrific person. Uh, and And so there is so much here, right? And and yet uh, you have uh, uh, an artist who is uh, incredibly frustrated. You have council members who are rightfully incredibly frustrated and, uh, and not seeing any progress. So, you know, I, I understand as, as even Vinny was, I think very uh, 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 sensitive to the, the, both the COVID moment and the budgetary uh, implications for the city of New York. But as I mentioned earlier, right, there are important projects that have moved forward that have been approved. This is such a high profile piece. Uh, this is such an incredibly important uh, work. And to have, um, you know, the artist uh, speaking in these terms, uh, you know, as Councilmember Barron uh, spoke earlier, you know, why can't we uh, do some of the things that, that uh, Vinny is talking about and move some of this forward, even as you press uh, the mayor and the Office of Management and Budget. And I will just say this, you know, if the mayor wanted to get this done, he certainly has the power to call um, Dean Foulihan or I, I realize Melanie Hartzog has now uh, been promoted to deputy mayor, but uh, uh, now director Jiha, um, uh, if the mayor called him and said, you know, free this up, uh, move this project, it would happen. Uh, so yeah, I realize you, 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 you don't have control over that particular uh, series of conversations, but you have a voice and, and you certainly have the ability to work with the artist here on some of the preliminary steps to, to once 
you get the approval for the uh, funding uh, to be uh, um, taken the, the pause off, get this done more quickly, right? This, um, I forget the exact date when, when uh, uh, Vinny was uh, awarded uh, uh, and chosen as the artist here, but um, uh, you know, this, this is dragging on for years potentially. And um, you know, how can you move this faster? What can the administration do to make this happen? I believe, and, and, and may I call you Vinny? Um, I believe we're at a one year mark, probably um, since you're, you're muted. Can you unmute Vinny Bagwell? October 4th was the presentation of the finals. October 6th was the announcement of the official winner. It's been more than a year. Yeah, I mean, a year and a few weeks. Um, um, uh, uh, let me clarify a couple of things. One is the this is not a funding issue. This is a cash flow issue. The funding for this project is secure and it's in place. Um, the, the question is where can we start um, um, uh, unpausing or removing the pause on, on capital projects based on city's uh, cash flow that is uh, much larger than you know um, the Department of Cultural Affairs. It has to do with the city finances. Um, and then I'm, I must be honest with you, I don't know exactly why the process is like this, but uh, again, in order to start having conversations with uh, Bini in terms of uh, her contract, a contract with a, with a um, contractor that's gonna be building the uh, monument and needs to be first. And that's um, the first step on, on, on the process. So can I, uh, 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 Commissioner, do you know the amount of uh, funding for this particular uh, piece of work that's involved? I can't remember off the top of my head um, right now. Apologies Vinny, do you know? Uh, can we un unmute Vinny? It's a million okay. project. A million dollars? One million dollars is the project budget. Right. So, um, you know, I will just say, um, Commissioner Casals, and again, I know this is ultimately uh, not your call, uh, but uh, we have had um, uh, projects that are in the tens of millions of dollars taken off pause. Uh, and this is $1 million, even for a city that is going through what we're going. Again, if there was the political will to do it, if there was a priority uh, a memo, if you will, from the mayor to OMB, uh, this would get uh, unleashed uh, and fast-tracked right away, right, just right away. And I think that's what we're missing here is, uh, you know, uh, making this a priority. So, um, you know, I also just want to clarify one thing because. I understand you're saying that in the process, uh, Commissioner Cazales, you need to work with the, the person who's actually going to build uh, this first, um, work out that agreement, but that doesn't preclude you, does, does that preclude you from having a conversation with uh, Vinny? Um, and, Not at and all. So, I mean, uh Conversation, no, uh, not at all. And that's the part in which I wanted to, uh, as a second point, I wanted to apologize. I have been in contact with uh, Marina Ortiz who had been organized in the community around this um, project. I have been also um, in contact with um, council member Ayala, um, mostly in a reactive way when they were wanted to know something, they wanted to put pressure on this. Um, I would you know, answer the phone. I apologize, um, Bini, for not reaching out proactively, but I just I want you to know that um, uh, you're, you're muted again, Bini. Um, um, I want to apologize for that, and just but also um, tell you that you know I can I'm open to talk to um, you anytime you um, you need to. Can we unmute like, Bini? Uh, I think Bini had something else to say. I, I emailed you to introduce myself to you. I don't know where your emails go, but I emailed you when you got your job. I emailed you to welcome you and said that I would love to talk to you. I don't know that you even got that email because I didn't receive a response. I did not get that email and I apologize for that. 
you know, the one that goes through the city, I didn't have your exact email, but if I go to the website where yours and they say, you may contact this person there and you can write a nice little something. That's how I tried to contact you. If that doesn't work, you might want to look into that with your webmaster. Um, Vinny, do you uh, have anything else that you'd like to, to add in terms of your personal experience here and, and uh, well, you know, moving? It's interesting. This is a, a very interesting time. People are only now learning about the public art arena. This is a white patriarch arena. I was on the phone a couple of weeks ago with the Time magazine. I was trying to explain to them that you will not see a major change in the public art arena unless people make an effort to help neophytes get in. It is the kind of arena where you have to be invited in. You can't win normally a million dollar commission unless you've had a million dollar commission. That's why this is so important to me. Besides the fact that I wanna make this work, having won this commission now takes me above the bronze ceiling. For people who are trying to get into the arena, for instance, women of any color, women, people of color that want to get into the arena, they're gonna need some hand-holding. The question that I want to know, aside from my personal concerns, is how does the city of New York intend to enable new artists that want to come into the arena to come in? Because part of the challenge for those people is they need leadership. So that means whoever's running the commission needs to be able to know how to support those people. I assume that that's not in place now, but that might be something that you might want to consider developing some kind of program that helps new artists, people who've never had public art before, who are worthy because the quality of their work to be able to participate in the public art program in New York City. I think that's gonna be important all over the country because if the municipalities have not created some kind of safety net for the new people to come in, they're not gonna be welcomed in. Nobody's gonna give somebody a million dollars, 500,000, $100,000 to make public art when they've never done it before. They're gonna need some kind of transitional program, someone who already knows the ropes to be able to support them when they first win. So I don't know how that's gonna happen, but that's gonna be a major transformation of the public art arena, creating some sort of wherewithal for new people to come in Otherwise, you're going to continue to see white people competing to do public art projects for people of color because there are no people of color in the arena. I'm one of the very few. Yeah. Uh, the, incredibly important. And I want uh, to get Commissioner Casal's um, response to some of that. But I also see that Majority Leader Cumbo is, I think, raising her hand uh, to weigh in here. Um, Majority Leader, are you there? I am here. Great. Starts now. Thank you. I, I just want to thank you, uh, Vinny, for outlining the way that you have had um, for Commissioner Casals, because I believe what you're talking about is the type of breakthroughs that we need to see in terms of how do we create real pipelines and real opportunities and opening um, for artists and for communities of color. Um, what you're saying is so right about the public art arena. While I have seen nationally, while there has been some attention and focus to um, having portraits, um, having statues of women, as well as people of color, I have still seen that the conversation or the pipeline to having artists of color, as well as women to do those commissions has not caught up with the desire to see more public works of art. And for, I. So that's why this hearing is so important and these types of conversations are so important because um, until you have lived the situation, you can't really articulate where the, the, the barriers are. So I really appreciate you for articulating the barriers. And while this is not my role on this side, um, uh, Commissioner Casals has uh, been working with us in many ways in terms of having those kind of conversations. And I hear your frustration and you are totally on point and on board with your frustration in terms of the lines of communication. I would just say for Commissioner Casals, I know that when he first got this position um, in the middle of COVID, he also had COVID and not the type of COVID you stay at home with, the type of COVID you've got to go to the hospital and fight for your life. So I know he's not articulating that in the same way, 
but being thrown into a new commissionership with COVID, having to fight for your life and learning the ropes and not being able to meet and fully grasp your staff because of the challenges um, has been mm. a difficult one. But I would say everything you have said is spot on and that is the road to the type of revolutionary work that we need to see. More women that look like you need to be at the forefront of creating art that's representative of us as well as everyone. You know, you, you should not be designated to doing work about black women only. You could do statues of people of all races and nationalities the way, it's, the way we have been subjected to. So, you know, it's important for us to have those conversations. And I appreciate your honesty, your frankness, and you're getting it out on the table and speaking truth to power. So I appreciate that and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Majority Leader Cumbo. Um, and uh, for uh, very sensitively raising some of the challenges that Commissioner Casals uh, has faced. But I, I wanna uh, just maybe go back to a, a bigger picture piece that's part of uh, uh, sort of Vinnie Bagwell's experience. Um, uh, Vinnie referenced obviously Commissioner Finkelpearl's departure and um, you know, and, and uh, obviously, you know, I have great respect for him. Uh, there's some who, who believe that his departure it was in some ways uh, associated with some of the debates around uh, public art and, and statues and monuments. Um, so having said that, maybe you can, Commissioner Casales, go through some of the, the, the bigger picture, right? The, the, the status of, of she built, the status of all of the, uh, the public art and the statues. We talked a little bit about sort of all of them being on pause, all of them. Um, again, that's not your call. That's the Office of Management and Budget uh, who has paused uh, thousands of projects all over the city. Uh, but um, can you talk to us about, about the status of all of that, right? The, the commission, uh, you know, and all of these public artworks, uh, including Vinny's and, and, uh, what you're now doing, uh, and I know we've talked a little bit about this, but what, what you're now doing to, uh, to break that log jam and, and get uh, these works back on track. So one of the ones that is already on track because um, is the Chile Shinsom uh, monument. And that because it's tied to a capital project, you know, the very same plaza um, in which the monument is going to be placed um, has started. So that project, and they're like tied together, that project has started. Um, I don't have a specific um, timeline of when it's going to be finished, but um, like I said, you know, probably um, it's going to be sometime next year. And the other two that were our priority is uh, Victory Villan Sims and Tito Puente. And we're just continue to work. Um, they're both in different stages. Um, Tito Puente, it's in a moment that we need um, um, some of the funds released so the, um, we can pay the artists to start uh, working on the design. And, and we're just working into um, making those funds um, available to the artists. So Victory is uh, behind in, in terms of uh that uh, pipeline, if you will, right? So Tito Puente yeah, would uh, seem to be next and, and then victory? Well, they're, they're in parallel. You know, every time we talk about one, we talk about the other one. Um, Tito Puente started, the process started earlier. That's why we're at a different moment in the process. Right. But, um, you know, just those are the three that you are just focusing now. And, and, and maybe just work us through the timeline. Let's just hope that this hearing uh, is being monitored by the mayor's office and they have uh, heard uh, council member Barron and the majority leader and myself and Vinnie Bagwell and lots of other folks uh, talk about how this needs to be released and taken off pause and, and moved. Let's just say in, in the best possible scenario, uh, you get a call this afternoon from the office of management and budget and they said, Vinnie Bagwell is a very powerful voice and we, we cannot deny this any longer. Uh, we have uh, released uh, the funds for this project, which is $1 million, uh, again, within the scale of the city's budget, you know, a rounding error, but 
let's just say that happened. How quickly, what is the timeline for uh, getting this done? Um, if that um, best of all case scenario happens. Yeah, yeah, and let's assume that nothing else happens for the rest of the-, the um, Fair enough. The next year. Um, we're looking, I'm, I'm just looking at an email that has specifics, but I'm not gonna um, delay this uh, much more. We're looking at around a year once you know things are unblocked and everything's going. A year until completion or a year until the beginning? Completion. And that includes uh, the artist's uh, time and everything that uh, Vinny needs to do in order to uh, contract. get to a place exactly. of completion of an installation of the work. We're talking a year. Yep. Does that sound right to you, Vinny? Can we unmute Vinny? I would say it would be a year after contract execution. The question is how long does contract execution? My concern, Tito Prente, correct me if I'm wrong, has been going on for almost a decade. I, I don't want to have to live that long to negotiate contract to begin. So uh, the big concern is how to get to an executed contract. Once we begin, I believe a year is real. Uh, okay, so uh, 10 years would be uh, unacceptable to everyone. Yeah. Uh, and uh, let's uh, just hope and we will push uh, both uh, the commissioner, uh, I'm sure, and uh, this committee uh, to get the $1 million for this project uh, taken off pause. Um, uh, seems like that could be done uh, with a simple email or phone call from the mayor's office. Um, so I thank you, uh, Vinny, for joining uh, this. I think this was an important discussion that needed to be had uh, around uh, this particular piece, but also uh, all of the work and uh, uh, and centering uh, uh, women of color in particular and uh, artists. So uh, thank you, uh, Vinny, for your participa participation. And I think committee council, we will move on to the next person or panel. I, I'm not sure where we're at. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer. Uh, we have one more member of this panel. The last member of the panel is Atiba Edwards. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Van Bramer, Majority Leader Combo, Commissioner Casales, and members of the committee. My name is Atiba Edwards, and I was born on the island of St. Vincent, grew up in Brownsville, Brooklyn. And throughout my entire life, culture has always been a huge part of who I am, who I set out to be, and also the spaces I felt comfortable and welcomed at. That's one of the reasons I chose to take on the role of Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at Brooklyn Children's Museum, as I saw this as an opportunity opportunity to serve a community I know far too well, but also serve the community of Central Brooklyn and New York City at large. And it was really a full circle opportunity because I grew up coming to this museum more times than I can even remember. Earlier this year, I was appointed to the chair of the CIG's DEI committee, which is now renamed to the IDEA Committee, Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Access. We're working on many different things, but one of our current focus is really on workforce development as it's essential that we change the makeup of the staff of our cultural organizations, as that's a key part of shifting the culture of these organizations. Um, without a doubt, we need to improve upon and expand the staff who are working in a variety of positions from entry level through executive at cultural institutions. And it's very important that uh, Commissioner Van Bramer, you mentioned this in your opening remarks that our staff should reflect the culture of New York City. And our work isn't just on bringing in diverse talent, but more importantly, focused on supporting them to advance in all positions. Because when we're joining these organizations that historically are white, a diverse person joining a space like this oftentimes can be very traumatic. So that's why we think support is essential and it's starting to come to fruition. Um, in many cases, the CIGs have started to lay the groundwork, do their DEI plans and other internal work, such as getting support and buy-in amongst their staff, leadership and boards. And that's just some of the groundwork, but it's essential part to get this journey completed. Myself and many other CIG members, staff members have decided to join an organization um, and organizations that have a spotty history when you think about structural racism. Many of these organizations were founded in the 1800s to 1900s and on. So that's one of the key reasons why it's important for us to be 
systematic in our approach to changing the all too prevalent structural racism that exists. So that when we are starting to realize this change, the same as the changes will sustain as part of a daily fact practice, but also integral to everything these organizations are doing. And I'd be remorse to say that uh, more often than not, the work will feel like it's never moving quickly. But do keep in mind we're changing and rewriting, in some cases, centuries of systemic issues. But we are working on that. That change is happening, and it will continue to need to happen. But we've made that choice um, in the last couple of weeks and also the last couple of years to do that. And I think to close out with a quote uh, from James Baldwin, the world is before you, and you need not take it or leave it as it was when you came in. And the reason I really keep that quote close to, heart, close to my heart is that um, it guides the work I do here and it guides the work the IDEA community will be doing and the CIGs are doing. We've entered a world that is founded during structural racist times and we're working to change that. So thank you again for this time and I'd open the floor back up. Thank you very much. Uh, so how has your experience been? I realize you're you're chairing uh, the IDEA committee and uh, and you work uh, for a particular institution. So there's your, your, your experience within the institution you're, you're currently working at, but uh, maybe you can speak to some of the larger um, uh, organizations within the, the SIGs that are predominantly white. If, you know, are, are people uh, uh, moving? Are people doing things? Are you seeing the progress um, that you would want to see? Or is there a lot of resistance? Is there more talk rather than action? I mean, talk to us a little bit about what you're experiencing as the chair of this committee. I think there's been progress. Um, I would, I don't think there'll ever be enough progress because achieving diversity, inclusion, equity, and access, it's not a static place where you sit and celebrate. It requires ongoing work and really reflecting the times. If you think about work that was needed five years ago and work that's needed five months ago, they definitely overlap in many cases, but there's still new things that we need to take on. So one of the essential parts were the DEI plans that were created as they help guide institutions on the work that needs to get done and how it's gonna be measured. So to your question, I think there has and there will continue to be work across all institutions. Um, but I would, I would never say, I don't think enough will be the adequate term. There's work that's happening and it'll never be enough because we're, we're really rewriting history in many ways. So institutions are working, they're doing some self-reflection, they're, they're being called out in some cases and being held to task. But I think you're seeing reactions and response to guide the work. And it's, some of it's coming and some of it will come in the future as we continue to get to a place where we can share things publicly across all CIG. So, I can really speak on behalf of the Children's Museum and then the CIGs at large, but I would say work is happening and there's still a lot of work to be done. And I realize you 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 know may not have sort of numbers and figures uh, in front of you, but uh, can you um, can you sense? Do you see um, uh, progress in uh, hiring at at, uh, at leadership levels? Um, and, um, you know, I know that, that some of the very large institutions have made statements, uh, uh, about structural racism within the, the institutions. And, and that is a form of progress, I suppose, but, uh, there's also, uh, the need to, um, make real the, the words into action in terms of, uh, leadership development and, and, and actual um, hiring in terms of curators and, and uh, artistic directors and uh, CEOs and, and whatnot. And, and are, are you even feeling that uh, sort of anecdotally and in, in, in your experience or is it, is it more words at this point? Yeah, I think it, it's, I feel it. And it's one thing to stand with and stand alongside, but it's another thing to actually walk the talk. So we're starting to see that. So a, a key part is the workforce development because that's developing the bench. That's supporting the bench to advance from entry level to C-suite and higher. So we can really put together a, a welcome environment where folks can see themselves growing to when those positions open, they can then step into them. 
when those positions open, they are, are feeling like self-care isn't me leaving this white institution because I've suffered so much. I've actually been able to su achieve, succeed, and move through the ranks. So I think there is and has been some change, um, but it's a key part of developing the bench. You know, like a position like mine in the COO suite, my plan is to be here for a long time. Um, so as a result, the next in line waits until the day I leave. So that's why workforce development is such an essential part of shifting the cultures because true change happens when a culture from the highest position all the way through reflects diversity. If we're talking predominantly led white institutions, there will be missteps, there will be things that aren't completely thought through in the right way. But if we start to diversify the bench and diversify the talent, we'll start to see uh, a fabric of cultural institutions that more accurately reflects New York City. So yes, there is change. I think workforce development is a key part of that because we're working to strengthen the bench. So when it's our time to step up, we have that ability to step into these positions and, and lead them to a, a better and brighter future. Thank you uh, very much, Atiba, for your um, testimony and for your work. Um, I know it's not easy uh, to create the structural change that you are engaged in, particularly at some of these institutions. I want to recognize Councilmember Helen Rosenthal has uh, joined our, our hearing today as well. And uh, very, very uh, thrilled that so many council members who are not on the committee have chosen to attend uh, this hearing. I think uh, the topic is such, uh, Commissioner Chris Howes, your cat is adorable, um, but uh, uh, behind you there. And, uh, but I, I do wanna say, I, I think we've uh, been joined by so many council members who are not on this uh, cultural affairs committee because the topic is so important and so uh, relevant and everyone uh, wants to be a part of it, which is great. Um, with that, I will turn it back over to our uh, council for the second panel. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer. Before we move to the second panel, if we could just check if there are any other council members that have questions for this panel. If you can please raise your hand if you have questions. Yep. All right. Well, I oh. see council member Rosenthal has raised her hand. Uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, thank you for being here. Time starts now. You have to unmute, uh, Councilmember Rosenthal. Yep, just okay. got just got the ability to do so. Thank you so much, and Jimmy, really, thank you for having this hearing. You know, Inez Barron and and her staff member Indigo has been have been champions on this, um, yes. and uh, I've been. Um, um, honored to be brought into their circle, uh, mainly because my district includes Central Park. Um, so I've been able to be a part of um, the work to bring the Mary J. Marion Sims statue down. Um, and I'm, I'm delighted with the community who found and supported Vinny, or Vinny found us, I, however it worked. <laughs> been lovely. Um, but I have to say, I was just at, I just want to press on the point, which everyone has pressed home, Commissioner. So, but just if I could add my two cents here, you know, um, uh, that the, the significance of that site is um, so important to, to just the community who live around there, as well as citywide, as we, you know, come to understand what um, Sims, the, the torture that Sims perpetrated on women. Uh, so bringing down the statue was very joyous. And the other day um, we had a press conference that was intended to be in front of the new statue or the placard, you know, marking um, why the Sim statue came down. And because the women at Mount Sinai Hospital, uh, the women physicians and medical students are suing the hospital and the medical school there for um, gender discrimination. Um, uh, uh, yes, of course, council member, continue. Thank you. And, um, and 
you should just know it was incredibly heartbreaking to show up and I had thought the work was already done. I just, I don't go over there often. I'm not following this too closely. And to see that it was still just the pedestal there um, with a placard that I don't, has anyone, I, I don't think is adequate, um, was very disappointing. And I just want to double down on what the chair has said over and over and over again, the significance of putting up the new statue. I mean, I, I just can't, I, I just want to double down on what the chair has said, what Councilmember Barron has said, and others in the community have said. What Vinny has created is very exciting. And given the, the what's happening in the world for the past two years, everyone is um, beyond excited to see it, the new work come in. Um, and, and, you know, if you're if you're prioritizing things, I, I really do hope that this is number one on your list. Um, there are so many people who want it, and it's important. I'm the chair of the committee on women and gender equity. It's incredibly important to a lot of people that this new statue, that Vinny's statue, goes up. So thank you, Chair, for giving me a minute to share my thoughts. Thank um, you for. Um joining us in your uh, important contributions uh, to this discussion, Councilman Rosenthal. I see uh, Vinny's uh, raised her hand. I don't know if Commissioner Casales wants to respond to Councilman Rosenthal uh, at all, but uh, uh, if the staff could uh, unmute Vinny, uh, who wants to say something. I just wanted to say that uh, the Victory Beyond Sims maquette is on view at the Hudson River Museum uh, in Yonkers until January 22nd, if anybody ah. wants to see it. Can you say that again, just so everyone has it and it's in the record? The maquette, the, the miniature version of the sculpture that I'm proposing, which would be Beyond Sims, the maquette is on view at the Hudson River Museum in Yonkers, New York, through January, I believe, 22nd. So if anybody's curious and just want to see it up close, it's, it's on public view until January 2nd at the Hudson River Museum in Yonkers, New York. That's fantastic. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Vinny. Um, Council. Right, thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. Um, with that, we'll move to the next panel. I'll start by calling all of the panelists and then call you one by one for your testimony. So the second public panel will be Taryn Sacramone, Amy Andrew, and please excuse any pronunciation errors, Rocky Bucano, and Raymond Codrington. So next we will start with Taryn Sacramone. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for creating the space for this morning's conversation. Uh, the chair, majority leader Combo. Commissioner Casals, uh, it feels like it's been a very candid and already productive conversation. I'm the executive director of Queens Theater, uh, executive vice chair of the Cultural Institutions Group and co-leader of Culture at Three. At the time that the theaters of the theater's closure, we were midway through a sold out run of a new play called Chicken and Biscuits by a black playwright with a black creative team, cast and producing team. It's a beautiful comedy, a love letter to black families, we were selling tickets to hip play ballerinas and looking forward to full houses of Queens public school children watching a company of black ballerinas. Then COVID, it was shattering to see communities of color, especially hard hit by COVID, by the murder of George Floyd, by resistance to the historic Black Lives Matter movement. Seeing this trauma inflicted on our colleagues and community, we created an online affinity space for black women, trans and non-binary community members. We curated a police reading series by black playwrights over the summer, including uh, one that told a story of police brutality and its effects on youth. Our staff members are doing the intensive anti-racism training with the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond as part of a consortium of performing arts organizations that are members of the CIG. Along with Shade Lithcott, 
of National Black Theater and chair of the Coalition of Theaters of Color and Lucy Sexton, New Yorkers for Arts and Culture. I lead the culture at three daily calls. There are hundreds of cultural leaders representing institutions of all sizes and disciplines across all boroughs. Uh, the partnership that Majority Leader Combo spoke of earlier today, the idea of larger organizations sharing resources with smaller organization. That's part of the sort of the day-to-day -day way that that space operates. Although I would say that it's a partnership uh, both ways because all organizational leaders are learning from each other. A call dedicated to the topic of racism in May drew more than 250 leaders. Individually and collectively, the Culture of Three community has been working to advance racial equity in the cultural sector. We formed a working group, which I co-lead with Regina Bain, Executive Director of Louis Armstrong House Museum, and Melissa Sander, Strategic Arts Consultant. Dozens of leaders participate in bi-weekly meetings, sharing resources and strategies, including skill building and facilitation. Of course, you heard Melody Capote of Caribbean Cultural Center African Diaspora Institute launch the Arts Go Black initiative, uh, offering anti-racism training to dozens of Culture at Three participants. Uh, when the Coalition of Theaters of Color was fully funded for this year, it was celebrated as an important moment for all on a call. There's a growing past the mic campaign where organizations with large social media followings lend their platforms to BIPOC led organizations. Each CIG member completed an access equity, diversity, and inclusion plan, uh, but we've also been working together with the team of leadership. Uh, I'm proud to be a member of the committee that he is uh, leading. Um, I want to recognize the leaders of the Coalition of Leaders of Color and other BIPOC-led organizations because it is only because of their decades of work that we have an opportunity to make change for the better. The work is internal and external, invisible and visible, short and long term. Most importantly, it is ongoing. I want to support the recommendations that are being made by my colleagues here today uh, and um, have more to say, but I'm out of time. <laughs> Thank you, Taryn. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the culture at three calls have really become uh, a thing, to say the least. But but thank you for all your work. Thank you. The next panelist. Next. The next panelist will be Amy Andrew. Time starts now. Good afternoon, members of City Council and colleagues. My name is Amy Andrier, and I'm the executive director of the Museum of Contemporary African Diaspora and Art, aka Mokata. Thank you for the opportunity to address the critical juncture that exists for my community. I will use this time to point out the lack of parity and consistent support for museums like Mokata, who serve the Black community specifically. As you know, Mokata was born from the graduate thesis of our founder and New York City Council Majority Leader Lori Cumbo on the feasibility of an African arts museum contributing to the revitalization of neighboring Black communities, politically, socially, economically. This origin story is similarly true for many Black arts institutions across the country. Most, if not all of our institutions were created with a different, within a different cultural framework than our peers. Our work is grounded in deconstructing colonial systems through the cultural and artistic, artistic lens, and we welcome those who have been systemically left out through arts education. The legacy of the cultural equity group speaks to this. The work of the People's Cultural Plan and the Cultural Justice Initiative also speaks to this. Simply said, our institutions have a double mandate or double remit that goes beyond just being arts and culture practitioners or making art for art's sake. We are critical resources for our community, safe spaces that deliver mutual aid in all of its forms. Black lives have always mattered. Black safety and social justice has, have always been our work. And yet nationally, African-American museums are underfunded due to historical barriers and cultural preferences for charitable giving. Only 6% of minority organizations receive comparable funding from individual donors to organizations serving mostly white patrons. Virtually none of us are accredited. Few have endowments beyond a nominal size, if at all. And many of us have had to cut staff programs or projects in order to remain open during non-COVID years. In recent weeks, we have seen firsthand how fragile our livelihoods are, especially in the face of twin pandemics, COVID-19 and racism especially when placed in the hands of broad legislation with little understanding of the nature of our lives and the, and the systemic limitations placed upon them due to an even slight hint of misinterpretation. So where do we go from here? I leave you with three questions to consider. How might the city and the philanthropic community review the strategy work that has already been done by thought leaders in the black community then and now, instead of seeking voices outside of our community to speak for or collect data on our behalf? Two, go beyond the performative to allocate baseline funding for black arts institutions that's comparable to those received by mainstream organizations. 
And three, proactively commit to a long-term plan, 50 years, 100 years, to ensure the sustainability of Black arts institutions, the livelihood of Black artists, and the survival of the communities that we serve. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amy, for, uh, what's that? <laughs> Thank you very much, Amy, for your uh, leadership uh, at Mokata um, and uh, uh, your three core suggestions or recommendations, shall I say, um, and uh, absolutely all should and need to happen. And, you know, I think uh, first thing we have to do is, is commit as a city to uh, not cutting funding for the arts, and uh, that would be a start. And and then uh, you know, obviously, I've mentioned some some ideas today. Obviously, I uh, support uh, uh, you know cutting a billion dollars from the NYPD at a minimum and reallocating those funds. But also, I called earlier for uh, fair and aggressive taxation of billionaires and uh, corporations that. Uh, would uh, not force us into this position of austerity where we are always saying we don't have any money and, and yet Jeff Bezos is worth $250 billion. So uh, we can do these things if we have the, the political will to, to reimagine how we operate as a society and, and that includes um, uh, taking on the billionaire class in a way that's real and reallocating resources uh, to uh, BIPOC communities uh, in particular uh, who've been robbed of, of so much uh, of those resources and now sit in the hands of men like um, Jeff Bezos and uh, shouldn't just single him out. He's not the only uh, straight white male billionaire uh, in <laughs> the world, but he's the richest so he gets, uh, he gets uh, top billing, so to speak. So, um, thank you, uh, Amy, for uh, that and your leadership. Uh, and I do want to also recognize uh, and thank Commissioner Casals for staying uh, at these hearings. When we used to have them at City Hall, the commissioner would normally speak. Uh, and then after uh, uh, she or he took questions from council members would leave um, at the hearing. And Commissioner Casals, uh, since taking on this job, is... Uh, committed to staying and listening to all of the public testimony. So I just wanna recognize that from the commissioner and thank uh, him for that. Uh, Amy, thank you again, and we will move on to the next panelist. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. The third member of this panel will be Rocky Bucano. Mr. Bucano, you may um, start when the Sergeant calls the clock. Time starts now. Thank you, uh, council members, New York City council members. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer. Uh, and thank you, uh, Majority Leader uh, Lori Cumbo. My name is Rocky Buchano. I'm the Executive Director of the Universal Hip Hop Museum, and I'm bringing you my testimony from our Revolution of Hip Hop uh, experience, which is a temporary sneak preview of the Future Museum, which would be located at the Bronx Point. Uh, I'd like to bring up a few issues. I think the, the uh, opening uh, testimony by Majority Leader uh, uh, Councilwoman Cumbo uh, was indicative of everything that hip hop represents. Hip hop has always been the voice of the voiceless. It has been in the middle of the Black Lives Matter discussion since its inception. So to us, Black Lives Matter has always been part of the fabric of hip hop. And hip hop, as everyone knows, is New York's most valued, treasured uh, music, dance, fashion, lifestyle, art form that has basically been adopted in every part of the world. Um, when we opened the Revolution of Hip Hop back in December, um, we had to, you know, like everyone else, we closed March 15th, but prior to closing, we had welcomed more than 10,000 visitors from all around the world. And that's just a sample of the kind of tourism that the museum will generate once it opens, uh, hopefully in 2023, which is the 50th anniversary of hip hop. 
Uh, we were supposed to start construction on our project uh, in June with our development partners, l and Development. Uh, the museum is part of a large and mixed use development project, which I think everyone knows called the Bronx Point. And now we're hoping, uh, you know, we're in discussions with HPD and Department of Cultural Affairs that we can close on this project uh, this December and begin construction right away so that we don't miss this major milestone, which is the 50th anniversary of hip hop in 2023. Uh, the Universal Hip Hop Museum uh, has, since we've uh, been operating and we've been bootstrapping uh, for over uh, eight years, uh, we, we've participated in, in a variety of different projects, including a benefit to, uh, to help uh, New York City's frontline uh, healthcare workers. We did a benefit called New York Love, uh, Hip Hop Loves New York in April, and we raised approximately $73,000 to support uh, Somos Community, uh, which is a nonprofit organization and the Bronx Community Relief Effort. And we were surprised at our funding uh, uh, request for programmatic money, uh, was not was not granted in this year's uh, uh, city budget. So we're just hoping that the city council and uh, 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 Commissioner uh, uh, Casals uh, recognizes the importance of this museum uh, because we do represent the entire spirit uh, of everything that we're talking about in today's testimony and, and public hearing. Thank you, uh, Rocky, for uh, all of your work, and uh, I look forward to uh, to, to visiting when uh, when we can. Um, just a point of clarity: Who is your local uh, representative there? Uh, we we have two uh, councilwomen Ayala and uh, Councilman uh, Salamanca. Got it. Okay, that's. Uh, Helpful and, to and, know. And, 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 and uh, uh, chair, Chairman, uh, yep. we will be reopening on November 5th. We have a VIP opening uh, next Friday, uh, October 30th. And I invite all of the council members to come. We have a COVID screener here. So we're, we, 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 we have partnered with a company called Souter Technologies. And they have a digital health uh, uh, gateway that scans people for COVID. So it measures your ambient temperature, your breathing capacity, your oxygen level, your heart rate, and it, and it gives you within 20 seconds, it lets you know if any of those vital signs are off. So that's just one of the steps that the museum has taken to make sure that the public is protected when we do reopen uh, in, in a couple of weeks. Thank you uh, uh, for the invitation. And uh, I also wanna just say that uh, instead of looking at everyone's bookcases like mine or the uh, behind their living rooms, you win for the most interesting <laughs> backdrop uh, in this hearing uh, because of the art that is behind you. Um, uh, I even uh, 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 took you off uh, the uh, wide pan of everyone and, and just wanted to look at what was behind you as you were speaking because it's so uh, thank, interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Rocky, and we'll hear from the next speaker. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. The last member of this panel will be Raymond Codrington. Mr. Time, Codrington. Sorry, time starts now. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Raymond Codrington, and I am the executive director of High Arts. We're located at El Barrio's Art Space PS109 in East Harlem. We're a leading cultural hub within the urban arts movement. For over 20 years, we have provided unique development opportunities to artists of color, always placing issues of equity and social justice at the forefront. To date, we have supported works by over 1,500 lead artists, and we serve an audience of over 10,000 annually at our home and nationally, with a local audience, with a local audience that is 75% Black and or Latinx. We are currently in the midst of a once in a lifetime crisis with two global pandemics converging, that of structural racism and COVID-19. With that said, what, the, what, will, what will the council's response be and what side of history will it be on when we look back at this time? As we consider defunding the police and redistributing funds and revenue to the arts, can New York City serve as a national model that speaks to the cultural worth and economic viability of the arts sector? 
These are definitely challenging times and, as, and it is obvious that structural racism does not pause during a pandemic. But we remain optimistic about the resilience of the arts to create change and help us recover and reimagine notions of community. We as arts organizations are uniquely positioned to frame discussions, programming and partnerships that address structural racism. What is clear is that we cannot go back to business as usual. The public frankly won't allow it. The stakes are too high and the time is now. A recent study by the Philanthropic Initiative for Racial Equity shows that 8.9% of grant making from foundations goes into communities of color in the US. Another recent report cited in the Chronicle of Philanthropy states that when awarded funds, the unrestricted assets granted to nonprofits with leaders of color were 76% smaller than those of organizations with white leadership. While we're hopeful that the philanthropic community will take note of these stark disparities and prioritize funding for organizations ded dedicated to and led by people of color, we also need public support from our local government and not, and not, just, pri not just private foundations. Maintaining initiative funding for the Coalition of Theaters of Color and FY21 was a huge win for our community and a great first step, so thank you for that. It is time for our civic leaders to adopt an anti-racist lens, continue to affirm that Black Lives Matter and support the organizations who have been here doing the work long before diversity, equity, and inclusion were popular terms. With that, we thank, we thank Chair Van Bramer, the members, of, the members of the committee, DCLA, and the C at Large for its partnership. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And, uh, you know, maintaining the funding for the Coalition of Theaters of Color should be, uh, you know, uh, the baseline of what we uh, uh, start from and then actually uh, uh, adopt that lens, um, as you discussed, when it comes to funding for culture and the arts. Um, I believe that uh, Majority Leader Cumbo has raised her hand, and uh, I would like to ask her to say a few words. Time starts now. Uh, Raymond, I want to uh, thank you for your presentation. I mean, it really spoke to so many of the things um, that essentially inspired me to run for office. I, when I first came into the council, I was part of an organization, um, and I'm still part of the organization, the Cultural Equity Group, and talking um, very much about that level of equity and highlighting for many for the world to see the inequities in corporate foundation and governmental funding uh, for organizations of color. And I know for council member Van Bramer, it was a huge feat to be able to protect the theaters of color initiative and program when really severe cuts were being made to the budget in all agencies across the board in all disciplines. And um, I'm happy that we were able to work together with the support of the theaters of color um, to make sure that uh, we protected that level of funding. But today's uh, hearing for me, Councilmember Van Bramer, was really so important because this really highlights how important the work is. And it really shows that we have so much more to do to dig way deeper because we are going to pull through this pandemic. But when we pull through this pandemic, it cannot be business as usual. It has to be a new framework, a new rubric, a new way of funding and supporting and promoting and celebrating um, all organizations of all cultural backgrounds, breaking down those boundaries of words like minority and majority and, and having a space um, in the city of New York where all cultures are respected and recognized. Because when we can create that level playing field, whether it's funding or other ways, then we start to tear apart racism. Um, as long as we continue to um, disproportionately fund certain communities over other communities, the, oh. the, the dynamics of racism are still alive and well. So I'll just end there. And again, thank you for all of those who have been on this panel today. You could have been so many places, but I appreciate you. I appreciate you, Commissioner Casals, for being on this call. I remember a time before I entered the council, after the commissioners did their opening speech, answered a few questions from members, they were gone. So this level of communication and interest is critical, but now we've got to turn to the revolution. <laughs> so thank you all so much. And thank you so much, Van Bramer. This was a brilliant 
panel and, and, and conversation that needed to be had. Thank you very much, uh, Majority Leader. And uh, uh, indeed, we are at the very beginning of a transformation. Um, uh, and we also have many more, more uh, uh, participants and speakers to go. Uh, so I do think this has been a, a very important hearing and in some ways uh, historic, but uh, we are not done uh, by a long shot. So we have many more people uh, from the public who would like to speak. So I'll ask the council to call the next panel. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. Uh, before we move to the next panel, can we please double check that there are no council members that have other questions for this panel? We are not seeing any hands, so we're going to move on. So I will read the next panel and then call you one by one. The next panel, and apologies for mispronouncing any names, will be Alton Amable, TJ Mohammed. Lucy Sexton, and Patrick Jaujoko. Mr. Amable, Alton Amable, um, when the Sergeant calls the clock, you may begin your testimony. Time starts now. Um, I'd like to thank um, um, Chairman um, Bramer and also um, the rest of the city council, including council member Lori Cumbo, for having this hearing on Black Lives Matter, including Black art. It has always mattered and uh, in this pandemic and this revolution that we in. It's important that the voices of our cultural institutions be heard. Um, I wanna focus on an area of why it's important to fund cultural institutions and black cultural institutions, uh, such as my, an organization called Tropical Fed that provides cultural programming for both youth and seniors. By them having the ability to come to our program, we teach them the history, we teach them the heritage. Um, therefore, they have an opportunity to come into the comp community and, and grow from there. We appreciate the funding we get from the city council, but is it enough? The question is always no. But it's important that you guys understand the work being done. For, for example, you know, someone learning how to play a steel pan should also know the history behind the playing the steel pan, and someone walking on stilts will learn the history of this came from Africa and walking across the Caribbean on stilts was how we told our story. So it's important for us to tell the stories of our, our culture by our people and not be dictated by other people in terms of their vision or how all seen us in different likeness. I, I appreciate, appreciate any opportunity we have to come on a stage to just showcase our culture. Because in doing that, what I have seen is Culture could be used as a tool to destroy racism um, because many people from different cultural groups come and say, oh, cool, oh, this is beautiful. I've never danced on stills before, could we try? It? And that unity in culture and arts, we need to put that together. Um, I just wanna ask one question in reference to the commissioner. He mentioned multi multiple year funding for small institutions. When will that program be started? Can we unmute the commissioner? Um, I'm, I still don't know exactly when that's gonna happen. Hopefully on the next round of grants would be, um, that you would apply in February, we're gonna be able to put that in motion. Okay, so that's for FY22? Two, yes. yes. Okay. Uh, 21 is already in motion, so. Understood. Uh, anything else, Alton, or? Um, that's it. I see uh, the council member has a question. Sure. Um, we, can, we can go through the panel and then hold it. Is it okay, Chair, if we hold council member questions to the end of the panel? Uh, well, if, uh, if the majority leader has a question uh, for uh, Alton specifically or the commissioner, I'm oh, more than fine with her asking her question. Majority Leader Combo. Time starts now. I don't have a question. I just want to say, as we would if we were in person, I just love Tropical Fet and they do incredible <laughs> work. And I just love that organization because they are so centered around our youth and children. And in this movement and this time, all the work that we can do to focus on our young people is so critical. And so I thank you so much for your leadership and for your work and for giving our children a platform and as soon as I can, my son is going to be right over there with you playing. 
Uh, well, beautiful. So my background actually is the studio that's in your district. So we're looking that's forward right. to welcoming your son at Complete Music Studio. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and and council, any any council member can interject at any point if they're going to praise uh, our cultural organizations and uh, particularly their work with children. So that's a beautiful thing. Um, who's next? All right. Thank you so much, Chair, and thank you, Majority Leader. Our next witness will be T.J. Mohammed. Time starts now. Good morning and uh, salams to everyone. Um, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Council Members, Community Leaders, Fellow Artists. Um, I also um, acknowledge uh, Vinny, who has been um, a very great um, inspiration to um, a lot of the things that I do in uh, public art. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today in Black Lives Matter anti-racism, structural racism in the arts. I'm a multidisciplinary artist from the Bronx. I was born in Ghana. Um, my, uh, the process of my artistic practice is just opposing my personal and historical um, references, including community stories. Um, I, I create in symbolic engaging discoveries, which are sometimes viewed as group portraits or community portraits. I communicate the hopefulness and discarded remains of our lives. Um, among many works that I've done in the public is a recent one that I designed the word black in Black Lives Matter mural, uh, which is at Foley Square in front of, of the courthouses. Um, I'm inspired by a quote by Nelson Mandela, which says, it is in your hands to create a better world for all who live in it. We all know for centuries, art has to remain a leading God in changing the world and putting it where it's supposed to be. Um, in the US, we see it clearly has, um, uh, as a way of um, how art has been able to change and engage communities. And also most importantly, um, teaching our children and encouraging them to think big. Personally, I've been supported by the Bronx Council on the Arts through um, the DCLA. And in creating story circles, that is where I seek inspiration for the work that I do through mosques, churches, communities, and sidewalks. In addressing the Black Lives Matter mural, in, in designing my Black Lives Matter mural, I was thinking about what it means to be Black, what it means to be Black in America, and what it means to be Black at this moment. Most of the stories that I've collected are lamentation from people about stepping out of their homes, being afraid to do that, and even staying at home and being killed while they are enjoying time with families and loved ones, just like Brianna Taylor. I was born in Ghana. Amadou Diallo was born in Guinea, yet he was killed here in the Bronx. I, I remember a lot of the conversation I've had with his mom of how she lamented on how uh, the dreams that Amadou Diallo had and the families he supported even here in the Bronx and most importantly in Africa, which seeks to be all our roots and identity. Um, I interpret the word black in looking at what it means in terms of our current climate change in the world, because it's not only about the color black, but, but it is also about uh, living in your minority. It is also about the LGBTQ I'm inspired. palette. Symbolically, I emphasize all of this and pay homage to the, uh, through the African burial ground and respect to the march by uh, Dr. King in 1963. Many brothers and sisters have been killed, uh, families have been brokering, aspirations have been shut down, mothers and children who, who are the family and who are the backbone of our uh, nations have all been, uh, have their dreams in uh, shattered. I know the history of a nation is embedded and rooted deeply in uh, people. And we all know the history of New York and America is embedded in black, colored, and minority. Finally, I urge all to support our cultural institutions and encourage them to do conceptual programs. Uh, New York City in general has been um, a leader in changing the world, inspiration conceptually, aesthetically, and also activism for people around the world. I will end by reconstructing Nelson Mandela's quote and saying it is in our hands to make New York City a better place for all who live and visit it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mohammed, for sharing your story and your work with us. And 
as a queer man, I want to thank you for uh, mentioning uh, the LGBTQ community, which is uh, uh, the first time that uh, we've uh, uh, recognized uh, the LGBT community today. So thank you for that inclusion. Thank you. Uh, and I believe Councilmember Rosenthal has raised her hand. Yes. Time, st time starts now. Or if, if there's a question or a comment from Councilmember Rosenthal before we go to the next panelist. Thank yes. you, unmuted Councilmember. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Muhammad, I'm listening to you describe your story and just very enthralled. Um, I'm wondering where your mural is. Yeah, um, the one for Black Lives Matter is uh, in front of the courthouses downtown by Foley Square. Okay, by Foley uh, Square. Oh, wow. Okay. I designed the word black. Do, can you give a specific address? I just for the record, I would okay. love I would love this to be in the record. Um, I think uh, Commissioner Gonzalo um, give the exact, but I know it's in front of the courthouses by the uh, Terry Gold Marshall's courthouses uh, next to the Triumph Fund. I mean the uh, sculpture piece that is right opposite the uh, the courthouses by Foley Square. But the exact, yeah, but it, the, the street has been named um, Black Lives Matter Boulevard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, starts, uh, it starts at the municipal building and finishes in front of the courthouse. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure that got in the record. Beautiful, beautiful Thank work. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Who's next? Thank you so much. Uh, the next panelist will be Lucy Sexton from New Yorkers for Culture and the Arts. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer, Majority Leader Combo, Commissioner Casals, and members of the City Council for this important and urgent hearing. My name is Lucy Sexton. I am with the Cultural Advocacy Coalition, New Yorkers for Culture and Arts. A few days after the murder of George Floyd, John Wright of the Wright Group spoke to hundreds of cultural groups on our three, Culture at Three call. Among other powerful and devastating remarks, he asked us in this crisis, whose jobs would be the first to go? which groups would be the first to close. It would be the lower paid workers, the lower budget organizations, both of which are disproportionately BIPOC identified. This is indeed what is now happening. I just found out that Arts East New York, the only cultural center in that area of Brooklyn is, has officially closed. I know that many today will speak of the work being done for the art, by the arts and culture sector to examine and excise the scourge of racism in ourselves and our organizations. We also need to talk about a radical reimagining of New York City's cultural landscape. We cannot come out of this terrible time with a decimated arts and culture landscape that is more white and more centralized than it was before. And we need your help, Council. It's not just money, it's also policy. In the 70s, the city was broke and artists moved into empty industrial spaces in Soho. Because the scene was almost entirely unfunded, it was largely white artists from middle class backgrounds. When commercial interests wanted that neighborhood, the city created a system of artist certification, which kept artists in the AIR buildings. But the city limited artist certification to those living in that small section of Soho. What if this council now opened up the artist certification process, which still exists and functions, to include artists living in, throughout the five boroughs? What if we certify artists performing in rooted theater in Brownsville, dancing with full circle soul jazz in the Bronx, or playing world-class salsa at Terraza 7 in Queens? What if being certified meant you had access to artist housing, freelance artist health insurance, discounts at cultural institutions? Then kids would see that being an artist in their neighborhood, not just in Soho, was valued and was a viable option for making a living. There are many other policies to look at which might fundamentally change not just the demographics of the cultural field, but the shape of the sector and who gets included. I talked to a theater maker yesterday who was asked by the administration to produce an outdoor event and told the city would reimburse, but she'd have to put up $30,000 to do the event first. That kind of system necessarily favors groups with deep pockets. The system is entrenched in economic pop practices, which tend to keep the field white and middle class. 
as we dismantle it and rethink it. Let's start by going to where cultural is, ha is already happening in every community and seeing what we can do to support it there. We were also grateful and pleased that the city council made Weeksville Heritage Center a member of the cultural institutions group last year, but there's no transparency to that process still. Let's make it intentional and clear that I'm we're IG that recognizes and invests in organizations run by and serving BIPOC people. I'll end by remembering a woman's testimony in the first COVID he's hearing at the council back in April at the height of the horror. She said, why is it that the same communities dating back to redlining that are hardest hit by these crises? And when at long last the people in those communities are, when are they going to be given a seat at the table when the time comes to figure out how to recover? Let's build a new city with those voices at the center of the conversation. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Lucy, for um, your, your advocacy, uh, your passion, uh, and your suggestion for a very good piece of legislation, which uh, I've just asked my legislative director to pursue uh, based on your testimony. Um, and uh, uh, absolutely, um, support the transformation. I see the council member Barron uh, has a question. I wanna call on her right away. Uh, thank you, Chair. Time starts now. Thank you. I just, I heard Arts East New York reference in the testimony. So I just wanted to give acknowledgement to the great work that they have done while they were functioning here and how they involved the community at a very functional and grassroots level. And we certainly appreciate all of the work that they have done presentations and how they have stimulated children's minds. And I do want to just call attention to the fact that we do have another arts group that is doing working here and that's Victory Music and Dance directed by Nicole Williams. They're doing a great job as well. And I just wanted to give them a shout out. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thank the, uh, I just will just say that the story that I was referencing was Catherine uh, and Bali Green Johnson when she founded Arts East New York. She talked about that she was founding it because there were so few opportunities for her kids to take dance class or study without leaving the neighborhood. I'm very glad to hear about Victory Music and Dance as well. Thanks, uh, Council Thank Member. You. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Council Member Barron. Majority to combo. Time starts now. You're still on mute, Majority Leader. I definitely want to thank you, um, Ms. Sexton, for your presentation. Um, I too um, am very upset and disappointed and saddened by the closing of Arts East New York, um, a phenomenal organization in a community that does not have uh, a plethora of organizations and is certainly in need of more cultural opportunities and expressions. And it's imperative and important that we make sure that the organizations as well as the leadership um, of, of those organizations are sustained, held together and supported um, at all levels. Um, a district like mine has thousands of organizations um, that I am responsible for supporting. So it's important that we make sure that in organizations like Arts East New York and those communities are well supported and cared for and nurtured, um, particularly during this time. So I certainly um, appreciate that and look forward to working with you, Chair Van Bramer, on that legislation. Yes. Some really good ideas are coming out of, of, of this hearing. And uh, Assembly Member Roger Green has said that uh, demonstration without legislation leads to frustration. <laughs> so it's important that we keep these uh, ideas percolating so that we can uh, make sure that those critical community-based organizations sustain themselves. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, uh, both Council Member Barron and Majority Leader Combo. Uh, who's next? Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. The last member of this panel will be Patrick Jao Joko. Again, apologies for any mispronunciation. Mr. Jao Joko, you may begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Time starts now. No worries about that. And thank you. And good afternoon, Chairperson Jimmy Van Bramer, Commissioner Gonzalo Casal, and members of the committee. My name is Patrick Hauhogo. I am a first generation Filipino American cultural organizer and arts worker calling in from occupied land of Lenape and Canarsie people in Brooklyn, New York. 
I'm testifying today on behalf of Arts Workers for Black Lives, an organizing body of New York City art artists and art workers, seated from an open letter of the same title released on June 3rd, now dedicated to decolonization, abolition, and reparations in the arts economy and beyond. We are here to demand equitable redistribution of public funds to the most vulnerable arts workers and divestment from NYPD co cooperation and enforcement in the cultural sphere. Black indigenous and people of color arts workers disproportionately hold the most precarious jobs in the arts as freelance artists, entry level administrators, curatorial assistants, teaching artists, front of house staff, and more. We are the lifeblood of New York City's cultural economy, and we face the multiple pressures of the present COVID-19 pandemic and subsequent layoffs, along with historic systemic racism in the cultural sector and in our day-to-day -day lives. The steps taken by DCLA, including relief and support packages, have been complicit in material, materially prioritizing institutional bottom lines and the interests of their most senior leadership, while, contributing, while continuing to marginalize and insufficiently resource the lives of the wage workers and lower income employees whose labor undergirds this economy. I implore you all to move away from discussing the arts as an abstract idea and instead recenter artists and art workers, particularly black indigenous people of color and low income workers. We ask that you publicly acknowledge the complicity of DCLA in systemic oppression, beginning with the material construction of city funded cultural institutions on stolen land with stolen wealth gotten from economies of slavery, indentured servitude, and American imperialism. We also ask that you defund all coordination of NYPD contracts in accordance with the demands made by the historic Black-led movements and uprisings in our city. Finally, we ask that you publicly release data of cultural institutions investment in local law enforcement. In conclusion, it is imperative that the DCLA and the cultural institutions of our city take heed of these historic uprisings and pressures of the COVID-19 pandemic as a moment to truly reckon with the root causes of structural racism in our sector and beyond, being the occupation of indigenous land and histories and ongoing legacies of enslavement and imperialism. In order to move forward as a cultural sector, we need to materially center the voices and needs of BIPOC wage workers, not the bottom lines of large institutions founded in extractive economies. Um, that's it, thank you for your time and I see my time. Thank you very much. You said uh, an awful lot in two minutes and 50 seconds uh, and uh, incredibly challenging and powerful uh, testimony. And uh, I don't think, uh, um, Commissioner Consal, uh, Commissioner Casal um, uh, is free to weigh in, but but may not, uh, you know, want to. Doesn't uh, is not required to. But um, but I uh, appreciate everything you said, Patrick, and uh, um, take it to heart. Um, Commissioner Casals, did you want to address any of that? No. Okay. Um, but. Uh, uh, thank you, Patrick, very much for for joining us and um, and challenging us in in those ways. Uh, Council, is there more on this panel or? No, Chair Van Bramer, this is the last member of the panel. So if we just if we could just check for any other council member questions before we move forward, we're not seeing any hands. Okay. All right. Um, so we'll move to the next panel. I will call all the members of the panel and then call you individually to testify. The, the members of this panel will be Lisa Gold, Antonio Cerna, Alejandra Duque Fuentes, I'm so sorry, please excuse the pronunciation, um, and Nicole Tuzin. Tuzin. Uh, the first member of the panel will be Lisa Gold. You may begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you. Time starts now. Good afternoon, thank you. My name is Lisa Gold and I'm the executive director, <clears throat> excuse me, of the Asian American Arts Alliance or A4 for short. We're a 37 year old Brooklyn based service organization dedicated to ensuring greater representation, equity and opportunities for Asian American artists and arts organizations. And I wanna thank you, thank the council and the commissioner for your work um, and for the opportunity to share my testimony with you today. Um, we, we all know that the city has been rocked by the COVID pandemic and its effects have disproportionately affected people of color, 
Um, the Asian American community has reported an increase in unemployment from two and a half percent in February to 15 percent in May, the greatest rate of increase among all racial groups across the country. And I'm not even going to get into the shameful spike in anti-Asian racism and racist attacks on, um, on our community. But I am going to call on the city council to acknowledge the deep loss affecting the Asian American community and for the council and the Department of Cultural Affairs to discontinue its practice of perpetrating inequitable funding to Asian Americans, further exacerbating this crisis starkly revealed by the pandemic. Um, Asian Americans make up nearly 16% of the population of the city of New York, yet in FY20, AAPI serving organizations received only 3% of program funding from the Department of Cultural Affairs. In FY20, the average DCLA program grant was about $46,000 but the average grant to AAPI organizations was only $31,000. So I wanna know why do we deserve 32% less than other organizations? Why are we only receiving 4% of grants when we make up almost 16% of the population? So I'm, I'm asking for equity, that's all. No more, no less. I mean, I, I totally get that the city has very hard budget choices to make, but continuing to underfund Asian American artists and arts organizations on top of the devastating losses our community is facing, it's just, unconscionable for a budget that was negotiated with a focus on achieving equity, uh, particularly for low income communities of color. So I hope that by being fully transparent in funding decisions and through the release of BIPOC funding statistics that the city council and the Department of Cultural Affairs can demonstrate its commitment to racial equity. And so I ask that the that funds be allocated equitably across the city population and also publish those statistics demonstrating that commitment. And also I'm gonna throw in a plug for the um, Communities of Color Nonprofit Stabilization Fund because it is critical to building capacity and ensuring that organizations serving people of color continue to survive and thrive. So with that, I cede my time. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Lisa. I appreciate your uh, testimony. And again, uh, challenging both the council and the uh, Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, I think one thing we absolutely agree on is that the budget that we just adopted was not uh, fair and just and equitable. Um, and uh, that's why I voted against it. So um, we will, uh, uh, we need to do better and, um, and you have every right uh, and should hold us uh, accountable. So uh, Commissioner Casals and I am sure will be talking about uh, all of this and more. And uh, thank you for, for being here and uh, uh, speaking to also the, the Stabilization Fund, but thanks. Thank you so much. Chair Van Bramer, I'm gonna to move to the next panelist. That person will be Antonio Serna. You may begin when the Sergeant calls the clock. Time starts now. Good morning, Chairman uh, Jimmy Van Bramer and Commissioner Gonzalo Casals and members of the DCLA. My name is Antonio Serna. Uh, I'm the co-organizer of Museum Workers Happy Hour. It was a happy hour created by and for museum workers of New York City. Our goal was to bring together museum and cultural workers from across the city to share experiences, workplace improvement strategies, and as a platform to empower rank and file workers, and all help to shape museums and cultural institutions from the ground up. I'm testifying today specifically from the Museum Workers Happy Hour uh, Black Indigenous people of color workers working group, which focuses on the intersectional conditions of BIPOC museum workers, as well as the needs of BIPOC communities. The situation has become apparent that the internal mistreatment and discrimination of workers of color inside predominantly white institutions has gone from bad to worse in these difficult times. It has been noticed in, noticed in the press and on social media by activist groups like For the Culture, Change the Museum, Artists for Workers, and they colonize this place to name a few. Uh, We've compiled a list of what we've been hearing, seeing, and experiencing, but due, due to time, I just want to read one point, is that some of these institutions are presenting their community organization relationships and DEI implementations that were initiated by BIPOC, BIPOC workers who now have been laid off. And, that, and now there are few, if, if any, BIPOC workers with institutional knowledge left at these institutions. Uh, this accounts, this, this equates into a loss of a generation and the failure of DEI plans to empower and protect workers of color. Um, 
So what needs to be done? Uh, this new level of intensity calls for an urgent attention and immediate action from your committee. Museums and cultural institutions uh, both uh, receive so much support from the citizens uh, and we need this racial discrimination, uh, this reciprocal, reci reciproc reci reciprocal reci relationship between the community and these institutions that was once tenuous is now shattered and broken and requires impactful strategies including considering legal ramifications, assessing damages and imposing penalties to the full extent of the law, rather than slow moving, superficial performative changes in order to build anew. For one, we would like to uh, citywide review of DEI plans uh, reviewed by an external council. And we, we suggest the council be composed of organizations historically rooted in fighting racism, community members most affected by cultural racism and BIPOC rank and file museum workers, all with the support of the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Such rooted organizations might include NWACP, National Urban League, and the Congress for Racial Equality. Uh, I, due to the situation that this, uh, this, this situation requires further evaluation, but next we need to think about the fight of racism under the current COVID situation which as you all, you all know, it has affected front facing workers of color more than anyone in the, in, within the city of New York. As we reconverged uh, this summer, it has been obvious that many layoffs were, were an added emotional and mental shock to many. For one, uh, just a few years back, some of these institutions had millions in their endowments and were raising money, millions more to expand and rebuild their museums but for some reason they couldn't do the same for the workers in such desperate needs. In any ethical work environment, and we should, we should hope that the arts are maintaining nothing less, simple solutions could have been implemented. These workers have been unfairly terminated after decades of service in the industry. And so this too should be reevaluated. And we feel that outspoken BIPOC workers and museum and, and union workers have been targeted unfairly under this current situation. And yet we've even just yet to discuss how many workers were forced to sign this non-disclosure agreements under such desperate economic, physical and mental pressure imposed by COVID-19. Was that even legal? Certainly not ethical. Conclusion, the diverse, diversity and culture of New York City embodies that New York City embodies is currently and to the point hasn't been truly represented or supported by the CIGs historically. Uh, for cultural institutions to have value in the community they supposedly serve, they should do more and care for the support of the communities in which they inhabit, which also includes rank and file workers in their institutions. In addition to reconciling the past, including cultural reparations, which I have brought up many times before, uh, to claim diversity inclusion for the sake of publicity or to pause them under this pandemic is not only disingenuous, but it also propagates further exploitation of the communities that these institutions occupy. Respectfully, Museum Workers Happy Hour, the BIPOC Workers Working Group. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Antonio. And I, uh, I wanted to hear everything uh, you had to say uh, and uh, 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 very powerful and challenging. And, uh, look forward to hearing more from you and uh, the the working group. Um, there were there's some really uh, good and constructive uh, suggestions in there as well uh, as a call to justice. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. Uh, the next panelist will be Alejandra Duque Chifuentes. Excuse me again from Dance NYC. <clears throat> Time starts now. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me, um, Chairman Bramer and committee members and commissioner. It's always a pleasure to be in conversation with you all. My name is Alejandra Duque Cifuentes and I'm the executive director of Dance NYC serving the dance industry and sector here in the metropolitan area. I am a Queens uh, based uh, worker, but uh, we serve the entire city. 
Um, I'm speaking to you on behalf of the dance workers, dance organizations, for and nonprofit um, entities that provide dance services to the city and that nurture the cultural sector. Um, in the midst of a racial and health pandemic and the necessary resurgence of the movement for Black Lives, one of the most significant civil rights movements of our generation, and the most recent signing of the executive order 13950 by um, the White House occupant, Dance NYC has been working tirelessly to ensure that dance workers and organizations, particularly those led by and serving Black, Indigenous, and peoples of color, immigrant and disabled communities are supported and resourced. On June 22nd, I testified before this committee and on September 15th before city council, um, and I called for the committee to acknowledge the ongoing lasting impacts of slavery and to establish and execute a plan to address those impacts and repair the harm done by establishing a commission for reparations for past and continuing harms inflicted upon Black and Indigenous people, from colonialism to slavery and through food and housing redlining, mass incarceration and surveillance. We've also called for the prioritization of funding of BIPOC arts and cultural organizations and to provide necessary legislation that addresses the relief needs that these communities have, including rent relief, business interruption insurance, and proper funding from the Department of Cultural Affairs to be able to pay artists living wages in a city that is experiencing one of the most um, difficult affordability crises that we've ever experienced. And that was true even before COVID arrives. Each of these requests are anchored in our organizational longstanding values of justice, equity, and inclusion, and the necessary recognition that as a community and city, we must do more to ensure that our stated values drive us to take concrete actions that result in material and tangible benefits to communities impacted by white supremacy. Um, to act on these commitments this year alone, Dance NYC has first examined the racial impacts of our organizational practices internally. We established and raised salary floors, provided better benefits, time for rest, and the recognition that justice work requires emotional labor that is higher for Black and Indigenous folks, femme, trans, and gender nonconforming folks than it are than it is for for white folks and other members of the community. We've disseminated over one million dollars in relief support to the dance sector. We've launched an Artists Are Necessary Workers campaign to Time recognize expired. the vital role that artists play. We've collaborated with organizations, created resource pages, we've signed and created letters, and hosted a weekly field-wide call for the dance sector to address the issues, particularly the impact of racism in our institutions for the smallest of groups that don't have sometimes time to join the culture at three calls or to be in conversations readily with all of their different city officials. The time is now, y'all. We are losing institutions. I get emails daily from organizations that are closing their doors, studios that are closing their doors, workers that are fleeing. We have a mass migration of cultural workers leaving our city because they can't afford to live here because we have not, we've valued the product of art, but we have not valued the artists that make it. We are willing to pay huge ticket prices to go to a show, but we won't invest in the very lives of the people that allow that to be possible. And so I'm here before the committee to, to surface these needs, to remind you of the things that we've already asked for, um, things that we've already witnessed on, um, and to ensure that those things uh, come with concrete actions in the near future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alejandra. Um, uh... You are a powerful uh, leader of, uh, of, of Dance uh, NYC and, and um, I love that you're from Queens, of course, but um, uh, I, wanna, I want you to know that, that uh, we, we wanted to introduce a, a piece of legislation for Commission on Reparations. Um, that has already been um, apparently, we're not first in time, as we say inside the council. So another council member uh, has already proposed a piece of legislation, but we do not know who has introduced that uh, because the rules of the council um, don't allow you to know who has done that. Um, but we certainly want that to move forward. And as you know, we uh, uh, have, and uh, I can't believe we haven't already moved forward with open culture 
um, our legislation that would uh, dramatically impact so many uh, in the performing arts world because I too see um, so many cultural workers moving uh, and leaving and so many organizations uh, closing. So it is uh, uh, unacceptable. And we need to move on so many of these uh, pieces of legislation and so many policy changes with the urgency that they require that you would think that we all share. But as you say, sometimes we uh, value the product more than the people. Um, and it's uh, very frustrating to me that we haven't moved on open culture uh, and, and some of these other pieces of legislation that you uh, have talked about that uh, are in some ways moving but not with any kind of urgency. So uh, that the moment requires, but thank you uh, Alejandra for always being uh, here and, and calling this out. Um, it's uh, very important and uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. Chair Van Bramer, um, yes. I don't think that we have any council member questions. We're gonna move to the last member of this panel, which okay. is Cole. Tuesday. Time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair, uh, Chair Van Bramer, Majority Leader Cumbo, Commissioner Casals, City Council and Committee members and colleagues. My name is Nicole Tuzin and I am the newly appointed Executive Director of DanceWave. DanceWave is a nonprofit organization that provides access to a community dance experience that encourages individuality and whole person development throughout New York City and beyond. Our approach promotes an inclusive environment for all ages, abilities, sexual orientations, racial and socioeconomic backgrounds. We are proudly entering our 26th year of service, serving over 6,000 New Yorkers each year and nearly 4,000 more through our virtual classes and events. I am testifying today to share some updates about DanceWave's commitment to and work towards racial equity under new leadership. Like many other organizations, we believe in and issued a public statement in support of Black Lives Matter and named ourselves as allies to Black communities who have been harmed by institutional racism and violence. We outlined our next step to engage with the young people in our organization and to give them the space to share their thoughts and emotions and equally support their voices in advocating for change. While we know there is so much more to do, we are living out our promise daily. Programmatically, DanceWave is prioritizing racial equity as a central tenet. Our curriculum, Race and Dance, uses dance as a medium to support critical conversations with youth, helping students to process and embody difficult topics like racial bias, systemic racism, and privilege in a way that is both empathetic to others and relevant to their own life experience. Our DanceWave company program goes well beyond pre-professional dance training, prioritizing restorative practices as a mainstay and focusing on equity, advocacy, and wellness. Our Youth Leadership Council, in partnership with the mayor's office, empowers youth to become civically engaged leaders, tackling issues like racism that directly impact their communities. Organizationally, anti-racist pedagogy is a core part of our educator training, which is a yearly requirement for our teaching staff and an open program for professionals in any field and in any stage of their career. Administratively, DanceWave engages its staff in regular equity meetings to discuss, unpack, and investigate our actions, whether it be curriculum design, hiring practices, professional development, there's no topic off limits. We recognize that these efforts are important and are one small contribution to the dismantling of systemic racism in the arts. Being an anti-racist organization is an ongoing process and one that I am committed to as a, to advancing, excuse me, as DanceWave's new executive director. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, we love DanceWave uh, and uh, <laughs> have been there. Uh, terrific group, congratulations. And thank you for your commitment um, to the work that we're all talking about here today. Thank you very much. Um, so Chair Van Bramer, if there are no council member questions, we are not seeing any hands. There are no questions for this panel. We will move to what will be our final panel of witnesses. Those four witnesses will be, again, apologies for any mispronunciation. Yes, Mani Arboleda, Nikisha Hamilton, Mar Marina Ortiz, Ortiz, again, apologies. 
And I do not think the final panelist is here, so it will be those four. Thank you. If we missed anyone, we will also check at the end of the hearing, but we are moving to our final panel. So Yasmeni Arboleda, um, you may begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you. Time starts now. Good morning, uh, Chair Van Bramer, uh, Commissioner Casals, and all here present. My name is Yasmani Arboleda. My pronouns are he, him, his. I identify as queer and as Latinx, and I'm the artist in residence with the Civic Engagement Commission in partnership with the city's Department of Cultural Affairs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. The Public Artists in Residence, or PAIR program, is inspired by the work of Mirali Lederman Kilis, who was named the Artists in Residence for the city's Department of Sanitation in the 70s. Her goal was to erase the stigma of being a sanitation worker and to make the city look with new eyes at its waste and waste workers, essential workers, as they, are now, as they were not called yet. I'm honored to be a member of this artistic tradition, and I cherish my role as the Artists in Residence for the city's Civic Engagement Commission. It is a great responsibility to take on this position at, this, at such a crucial time during the Black Lives Matter movement, the global pandemic, and an election so consequential to the path which this country and city will, will walk. I believe that art and artists have a unique and essential role to play in bringing all New Yorkers together, helping us both understand and address systemic racism so powerfully denounced by the Black Lives Matter movement. Disparities in educational opportunities, environmental hazards, economic instability, unequal access to healthcare. Solving these issues will only be possible if we manage to rally our fellow citizens behind a shared understanding of the challenges some of our brothers and sisters face and inspire the civic engagement that is the cornerstone, cornerstone of meaningful and lasting change. And that is why I'm particularly excited to be by the bold ambition of the Civic Engagement Commission, since I've spent my career engaging communities around the world through co the co-creation of art. In a project called Coloring Faith All Over Kenya, people of different faiths united to paint their houses of worship, mosques, temples, synagogues, churches, yellow together in the name of love. The sculptures spoke of people from different backgrounds standing together and pathways between new friends were built. Another project, the Future Historical Society in Fort Greene, Brooklyn, and in partnership with Brick, a multi-generational collective of storytellers joined together to create a neighborhood archive that honors histories of Fort Greene's changing community while transforming its vision towards the future. In retired segregation as an artist in residence for the Integrate NYC youth-led organization, a youth-led organization that stands for integration and equity in New York City schools, we threw a retirement party for segregation on the 65th year anniversary of Brown versus Board. We created a newspaper that outlined improvements to New York City's segregated school system and passed it out in all five boroughs before converging in Times Square that afternoon. Through this art intervention, my young collaborators showed that students can be designers of solutions, advocates for transformative policy, and visionaries for a more just future. In one, it is one of the major tenets of my practice that art is a universal process through which we bring about real change and progress, expressing our shared Time expired. envisioning new possibilities, and helping make those ideas a reality. For me, art is a verb. The whole premise of PAIR is that artists think differently and have a power to model new approaches to civic work. Artists who are working together to address systemic racism, disenfranchisement, and other matters of social justice are key to bringing the divide between the cultural sector and civic life, which I think is where real change can happen. New York City has always been a beacon for progress and renewal. At this time of great hardship and profound change, I am proud to join others, artists and citizens alike, in fighting the racism that is the antithesis of the very idea of New York. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for your testimony, very powerful. Um, and uh, certainly appreciate uh, the inclusion of uh, queer voices in this uh, hearing, um, in addition to Commissioner Casals and myself. <laughs> Um, so, uh, thank you uh, very much for that. And uh, we'll go on to the next one. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. The next panelist will be Nikisha Hamilton. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Van Bramer, Majority Leader Combo, other city council members, and Commissioner Casales. My name is Nikisha Hamilton, and I am the founder and CEO of Afeni Creative Studios. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I created Fenny Creative Studios after I left the Brooklyn Museum because I experienced and witnessed racism. 
I want to focus on Black community culture development since I observed that, that there is a lack of structural support to sustain Black arts and culture. COVID-19 and this revolution only heightens my concerns. As Black people continue to fight to stay alive in America, it begets the question, how do we protect the Black cultural legacy? Black people are unable to have the agency and access to resources necessary to develop their own cultural discourse. Racism is a culture. And from my personal experience, some cultural institutions do play a role in preserving it. The structural violence that occurs within these institutions impacts our communities. How can Black people safely enter these organizations and work there? I experience pay equity, inequity, lack of anti-racist leaders, silencing of my voice, which led me to be pushed out, and finally witnessed the propagation of paternalistic racist discourses about our community. DEIA as a tool is not enough to fight these issues. New York City's most powerful export has always been culture and black people have been ghost writing New York City culture for years. Yet we are constantly disrespected by some of these cultural leaders that you empower. I challenge all of you to create policies and procedures that can effectively combat the cultural imperialism that is, is happening within our communities. I propose that large organizations submit to city go government community impact assessments if they are seeking fun government funding for their needs. This is to examine whether they are providing equitable access to their institutions for surrounding communities. We should encourage them to engage local businesses and local creatives to do projects to expand local economy. We can diversify streams of funding for organizations of color to develop their programs, operations, and funder fundraising. We can also have large org institutions institute community advisory boards and or have at least two seats on their board that community members can serve on. As I saw at the Brooklyn Museum, there is a lack of community representation in leadership spaces. We can also create equal friendly community centers that can host local organizations that are currently losing spaces due to COVID-19. If we have spaces like these throughout the five boroughs, they can serve as STEAM community centers. Finally, community members should have a say who lead organizations. Large organizations Time expired. Community. Now, conclusively, I hope you strongly consider my thoughts I share with you today. Black creativity has been key to the Black survival in America and how we conceived freedom from this oppressive system. In the words of Claudia Jones, a people's art is the genesis of their freedom. That being said, if we do not contribute to the sustainable growth of Black culture in our community, then we are serving in the extinction of the Black imagination and culture. Thank you for your time, and I'm more than happy to continue this conversation. Thank you very much, uh, Nikisha, for uh, being here and for sharing uh, that and for challenging us all. And um, I don't know what other people's screens look like, but right now uh, on my screen uh, is yourself, Nikisha, and Antonio and Patrick. And, and I feel like the three of you uh, came with uh, a lot of heat and a lot of uh, uh, fire and, and, uh, and, and challenge uh, and accountability. And, and you know, I, I, I like the fact that, of course, we have uh, many of the uh, folks who we traditionally hear from at these uh, committee hearings, and they're here. And I think it's important that uh, uh, they be challenged and held accountable, too. But I, I particularly like that this particular hearing has brought out some voices that we don't uh, traditionally hear from um, in terms of our, you know, SIG representatives or, or cultural leaders. And, uh, and the three of you are still on my one screen in front of me and uh, appreciate uh, the, the real challenge uh, that the three of you uh, separately, but in some ways uh, 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 continuously pose. Uh, to us uh, in leadership positions. So uh, thank you uh, for that. And uh, someone uh, texted me in the middle of this that we should have this hearing annually, that this should be uh, a must and that we should absolutely have uh, a Black Lives Matter uh, hearing at this committee every year. And we will 
certainly for as long as I am uh, the chair and hopefully the next chair will do so as well. But uh, this is uh, too important not to be talking about all the time. So um, I don't know if there are other speakers, but I will ask the general, uh, the general council, the uh, committee council to, uh, uh, to call the next speaker if there is one. Yes. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. The next panelist is the last witness that we have on our list. We will check for other witnesses um, if there's anyone else that we have missed after this panelist, but we'll now call Marina, Marina Ortiz. Um, Ms. Ortiz, you may begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, this is Marina Ortiz. I'm the founder of East Harlem Preservation. My apologies. I don't have a fancy uh, bookshelf behind me and you really don't want to see what's going on here. But uh, thank you also, uh, Gonzalo Casal, for always making yourself available, at least to me, because we go way back. Um, and everything, and I want to acknowledge uh, and thank uh, Vinnie Bagwell and Councilwoman Inez Barron for their words. And, and basically, they've said everything there is to say about the uh, failure to, to get the replacement for the sim statue going and so we've already heard i've been um at these uh hearings before in person and um via zoom and it's always been the same thing i understand and um respect that you you know basically we are not the ones who can make this happen right so i just need to know who is the one that can make it happen and invite them to come back to um a hearing like this because i'm looking at um, well, we have the murals, which are amazing, the Black Lives Matter murals. They just popped up just like that. So somebody obviously picked up the phone and made it happen. And boom, it happened. Don't know how much it cost. Not going to ask. Not even, I don't care because they're beautiful and they're something that we need right now in this city. Uh, so I just want to stress that and say that I'm going to keep pushing for Vinnie Bagwell's uh, Black Victory uh, installation to, to move forward. Um, and just to let you know a little more back. Uh, so as uh, Councilwoman uh, Rosenthal mentioned, we were at a uh, press conference held by um, uh, medical students and doctors from Mount Sinai representing Equity Now at Mount Sinai. And we were supposed to have the press conference speaking out around sexual harassment in, in that institution in front of the platform where the SIM statue first uh, was, but we were moved by park security. And we're talking about park security who came, um, the, the kind that had arms, okay? So they were like flabbergasted and upset that there were a group of mostly women um, and women of color standing in front of a platform that had for formerly honored Sims. We explained to them that the councilwoman was on her way, that the public advocate, uh, Jumani Williams was on his way, but that wasn't good enough. They called into whoever they called into downtown at 65th street, and they told us we still had to move. So we moved uh, the event across the street. And the reason why I point that out is because East Harlem, our outdoor artworks are places where we gather and we, they're cultural centers for us, for those of us who can't afford to have a roof over our heads when we do and honor our ancestors, when we play our music, when we celebrate um, important dates in our history. So that platform has already been- Time expired. Designated as a cultural center and we really don't want to be moved from it. So that's one. The other second is when will the Roosevelt statue be taken down? Um, and, you know, we're talking about all kinds of monuments. There's still others that we need to address. And I'm wondering about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think the first question you posed in terms of the who needs to, to make the phone call, I think uh, if the mayor uh, wants something uh, to be done and there's a sense of urgency around it, uh, it gets done um, uh, in in this city, uh, generally speaking. So I think you know that's that's a, a main driver in some of these questions. Just as much of the discussion earlier with with Vinny, uh, I think boils down to that as well. Uh, uh, Commissioner Casals uh, obviously has a role to play, but is not uh, able to. Uh, make the Office of Management and Budget release funding, um, the mayor can do that. 
Uh, I don't know, Commissioner Casals, if you have an update uh, on uh, the Roosevelt statue or anything else you might want to add in response to Marina. Can we unmute uh, Commissioner Casals? Um, two things um, regarding Roosevelt, my understanding, this is something that the uh, museum is going to take care of. And my understanding is they're doing uh, some studies of how to remove it because it's not only the monument, but it's also the, uh, the pedestal and that involves part of the building. Um, hopefully we're going to hear soon on, on a date. And then in closing, and to answer your question, Marina, which I know that I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, but you know, the ones that can make things happen is everybody that is on this hearing, right? Um, the idea of the theory of change is that you make sure that you put people that um, hold the same values that you have in power, and then that you create enough pressure, you know, for um, that person to be able to um, create the change, right? Um, and if there's an example of that, is um, this hearing today? Um, I, I want to thank you all for participating in the hearing, and I just want to pass it back to uh, Chair Van Bremer. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner uh, Casals. Um, I had one last question come to me through through a text. Maybe you can um, uh, give us an update on the status. Uh, is is Weeksville? Uh, 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 officially a SIG or is it still uh, in yeah. process? No, it's officially a, a CIG. Um, there was supposed to um, have been, you know, in early March, there was supposed to be a sort of a um, ceremony and because of um, the early um, days of the shutdown that got pushed back, but they're already a, a CIG. Right, officially a CIG. Um, great. Uh, uh, Council, are, are you, uh, should we make one last uh, check to see if there's anyone who would like to speak? Otherwise, I will call this uh, hearing to a close. Yes, Chair, let's do one more, one more check uh, quickly. So just before we move on, just to double check that there are no more questions for this panel. We're not seeing any council member hands. Um, so we will conclude this panel. And at this point, we have concluded public testimony. However, if we inadvertently miss anyone that would like to testify, please use the Zoom raise, raise hand function and we will call you in the order your hand is raised. So we're just taking a moment and we're not seeing any hands. Okay, we're not seeing any hands. And as a reminder, you can also submit written testimony if you did not uh, up to 72 hours after the start of the hearing, it can be submitted to testimony at council.myc.gov. If you did not submit testimony when you registered for the hearing on our site, you can also email it to that address or contact us and we're happy to help with that. Um, at this point, we have concluded the public testimony for the hearing. So Chair Van Bramer, we, I will hand it back to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I, I think this is one of the most important hearings we've ever had and, and one of the best uh, in terms of the diversity of voices and uh, those who are uh, challenging us and, and holding people accountable and, and uh, speaking from some of outside of the tra traditional cultural channels, right, that uh, we often hear from. So I'm really um, uh, glad that we we called for this hearing and uh, made it happen. And we'll also uh, certainly uh, next year, my last year as the chair of this committee, we'll, we'll commit to doing this hearing again uh, uh, so that we can uh, measure progress and, and have a level of uh, transparency and accountability. Um, so I wanna thank Commissioner Casals uh, for joining us for all four hours of the hearing. Uh, Majority Leader Cumbo, who is uh, uh, wildly uh, praising and snapping fingers. Uh, I see you, I hear you, I thank you. Um, and, and most importantly to all of the artists uh, and all of the cultural workers, um, including uh, all of those voices who are um, challenging the power structures that exist and the very powerful leaders of cultural organizations uh, and, and including uh, those of us who are in positions of power uh, I know it is uh, not easy, um, but it's incredibly important. So I want to thank all of you for, for being here and uh, participating. And I thought I saw 
uh, if I'm missing any other uh, council members, but thank them all for being here, all the voices for being here. There's a lot of uh, legislation potentially that came out of this hearing, um, a lot of uh, really good ideas to follow up on. I know that we're already moving and talking about some pieces of legislation that came out of this hearing. Uh, and I know that all of you will continue uh, your work uh, and uh, making sure that uh, we all uh, honor uh, Black lives and make sure that everyone uh, always, every day, not just in a moment, uh, believes and uh, makes real uh, that Black Lives Matter. So uh, thank you all for being a part of this and we are